Thank you all for joining us today for today's symposium. The program will begin momentarily. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the USC IISC Faculty Research Symposium on COVID-19. Good morning to those tuning in for the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, and good evening to those tuning in from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. We are so glad that you're all joining us today. Please join me in welcoming to the Zoom stage, Dean of the USC Viterbi School of Engineering, Dean Giannis Yorsos. Thank you so much, uh, Tiffany. Uh, good evening uh, to all of our friends in India, in uh, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, and good morning to all of us here in uh, the United States and Los Angeles particularly. I am not in an island. I wish I were, but uh, what you see behind me is simply a virtual um, uh, backdrop, uh, but uh, we are all together in many ways um, in these very uh, unusual times and uh, very unprecedented times to speak of. Um, it is a great pleasure to have us do this uh, uh, joint uh, symposium. I know that uh, India is going through the COVID uh, crisis as we speak, and so has been the United States. In fact, uh, even though restrictions have been lifted a little bit, I think that we are not out of the woods uh, in terms of uh, how the infection has been contained. The partnership of uh, USC Viterbi with uh, the Indian Institute of Science goes a long way back. A number of our faculty, in fact, are graduates of uh, IIC. We're very proud of uh, having them at the school. That includes 
Professor Prasanna and uh, Raghavendra who are here today. Um, we also have uh, joint appointments. Professor Vijay Kumar spends part of his time at USC uh, and he was in the faculty of USC before joining IIC. I myself visited IIC several times since 2005 when I became the Dean of Engineering here. We had a very excellent relationship with Professor Balki, uh, who was at the time, I think, the director of the Institute um, and he has since retired, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I have visited uh, and gave a seminar a couple of times. So we have very strong and cordial relationships and I am very happy to see that we have been able to put together a symposium of this type so fast and so seamlessly. And we are able to uh, exchange some scientific and technical information about this uh, um, infection, this uh, virus and how it spreads. Um, and we as engineers are, are charged with figuring out uh, how to be able to come up with solutions, both in terms of prevention, as well as uh, limiting the spread of the infection. So I'm very, very happy that we have today's event and I look forward to a wonderful, wonderful uh, symposium. Even though it will only be for two hours, I think it will be extremely useful and extremely productive. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dean Yorksos. I would now like to welcome to the program, Yadati Narahari, Chair, Division of Electrical, Electronics and Computer Sciences at IISC. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Indian Institute of Science, I would like to wish you all a very warm welcome uh, to this uh, faculty research symposium on a topic uh, which is engaging maximum attention uh, from the entire global community of researchers, a very timely and a very contemporary topic. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great pleasure. And uh, thank you, Yanis, for making this happen. I must thank uh, Raghu Raghavendra and uh, Vijay Kumar uh, for, for wonderful organization of this. At a very short notice, they have put together an excellent program in the space of just uh, one week. Um, I'm sure uh, this is going to be a very exciting uh, uh, workshop or symposium. And uh, it's, a, it's a matter of great delight for me uh, that one of the speakers is going to be uh, Victor Prasanna, who just this uh, December 2019 received the IISC Distinguished uh, Alumnus uh, Award. Uh, I am also very happy that uh, one of the talks from the IISC side is going to be given by Yogesh Simhan, who has a deep association with uh, the USC. And uh, another project on which uh, Sriram Ganapati is going to talk on, um, one of the collaborators happens to be Prashant uh, Kumar Ghosh, who also happens to be an alum of uh, USC. Uh, so I think USC and IISC have had a very long association and in the last five to six years, we are trying to um, forge a very lively collaborative uh, initiative between the two universities. And I think uh, this particular faculty symposium is coming uh, at the right time. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, we'll have a fantastic time during uh, the next two hours. And I'm hoping that uh, this will be the right kind of a trigger to usher in a very ambitious and a very lively and a very vibrant uh, uh, collaborative research program between USC and IISC. I would like to thank uh, Yanis again. I would like to thank uh, Raghu Raghavendra and Vijay Kumar again for putting together this absolutely wonderful program. I hope all of us will have a good time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Narahari, and Dean Yorksos too. I agree. I think we are going to have a wonderful time today. We will now begin the technical presentations from our featured speakers today. Um, and after each presentation, the speaker will answer a few questions from the audience. So throughout the presentation, please enter all of your questions in the Q&A box below. Um, the symposium is also being recorded and will be available at viterbischool.usc.edu slash online event series at the end of this week. Now I'd like to welcome back to the stage, Dean Giannis Yorksos, who will present a collaborative study with another USC faculty member, Asad Oberai, 
on a comprehensive spatial temporal infection spreading model with applications to COVID-19. Thank you, Tiffany. <clears throat> and I very much appreciate uh, given the opportunity to present this work. This is an ongoing work um, that he started uh, maybe probably three weeks ago. Um, you know, as dean of the school, I have been uh, uh, dealing with a number of pressing issues. Uh, how to finish the semester, uh, how to start the school for the next year. Uh, and then about Memorial Day weekend, which was uh, maybe three weeks ago, two weeks ago. <laughs> I forget how long ago it was. I had an opportunity to simply sit down and look a little bit at the models that exist for the spreading of infection. It's a very well-known <clears throat> model called the SIR model. And being a chemical engineer, I thought maybe I should look at it from a chemical engineering perspective. And in doing so, um, uh, we thought that uh, maybe there are some things in the model that can be uh, added and perfected in order to make it a lot more uh, perhaps applicable and, more, and, and also a lot more relevant. In the process, I partnered a lot with my colleague, uh, uh, Vice Dean of Research at the USC Viterbi, Asad Oberai. And uh, the work that I'm going to show you today, uh, and I'm going to now uh, share my screen. Is correctly here. Okay, so let me start with this presentation. So this, this is work that um, actually um, is a collaborative work, including uh, Professor Oberai and his student, Arisankan Ramaswamy, uh, who helped a lot with um, uh, creating a number of the simulations that you would see. Um, the model, uh, we call it a comprehensive, comprehensive, comprehensive special temporal infection spreading model. And the application is to COVID, although um, it is valid for any type of infection that, that you can use in which, that you, that you can have in which uh, the inspection is spreading by contact between people. The, um, uh, what is different here from existing models is that most of the models do not contain a, spe a special dimension. This is, it is only a temporal, uh, they're only temporal models. And in a way they don't count for a very important parameter, which is the density of popula population density in terms of the way um, this, the infection spreads. And population density, which let's think of it as equivalent to the density of a gas. Uh, and in this case, it will be a number of people per uh, unit area, or uh, could be unit volume, but uh, really uh, what's applicable is unit area, differentiates actually the population density, which is a key part of how the, inspection, the infection spreads. We all know that urban uh, uh, communities have a much higher inf infection rates than, area, than rural communities. And this uh, aspect is not counted in the existing models. And I will basically try to show you how we can take a, a, a advantage of this and how we can reformulate the problem to consider that. So let me go to my next. Uh, I have a couple of slides here. Um, since this is an, a friendly mathematical audience, I have had no qualms in using differential equations <laughs> in order to be able to show them to you. Actually, uh, as I was doing this uh, during Memorial Day or thereabouts, uh, it was a good um, relaxation for me because instead of dealing with uh, budgets and assignments, I had to deal with uh, writing differential equations, which is was a great, a great relief. Um, in all these issues of any type of uh, infection, there are three species that people usually consider. And species by, the, by species, I mean populations. People that are susceptible, every one of us is susceptible if we have not, if we were not infected. People that are infected and they are um, denoted by subscript I, and people that are, have recovered after infection, we use subscript, subscript R. This also includes people that have perished and they, because in the original model, the SIR model, 
uh, it was not a, an important parameter to differentiate between people that recover and those that, that perish. Now, many of the models that agencies are using, health agencies, are much, much more sophisticated than having only these three uh, population uh, uh, densities, uh, uh, species. And you have people that are, um, let's say, uh, you can have demographics in terms of wages, further uh, uh, differentiate between susceptible, infected, and recovered. Uh, in this uh, model, the infected people uh, still interact with susceptible here. So maybe the way we think about it should be that the infected people are all asymptomatic in the, in the sense that people do not know that they're different from susceptible, right? And so this is a model that actually started way back, maybe almost uh, 80, 90 years ago. And we use this model because it has been used in the literature quite a bit. And as I said, there is a lot more uh, fine grain in one can do in this population. But the goal of this study is not to differentiate between these populations, but rather to introduce the concept of spatial density, which is missing from any of the models. So um, when we deal with uh, chemical reactions, because an infection is nothing else but a chemical reaction that comes about as a result of two species that interact with each other, we write conservation equations. And the conservation equations, let's call them the mass balance. The typical mass balance contains a accumulation term, a term that comes in because of convection, advection, a term because, uh, that, that, that is in there because of diffusion, and a reaction rate. So this is a standard model of any chemical reaction in any chemical reactor. And in this case, N, script N, is the number density of a specific uh, uh, population. So this will be a number per unit area, or could be number per unit volume, Typically in a solution, it will be number per unit volume, but in the case of, of, of infections with, with people, it's clearly density is number per unit area. So if you look at this equation contains these additional terms, advective velocity, um, which actually could be very useful. Let's say if I were to have an urban and a rural area, and let's assume that, or suburban area, and let's assume that every day people go from the suburban area to an urban area, to their offices. One could use, let's say, an advective velocity in order to be able to, count, to, to account for that. There's a diffusion term here, uh, which is typically present to all equations in nature uh, or that involves populations. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that uh, because of random collisions, if you like, things move from one place to another. And this is a typical term that comes in, in pretty much every equation. Mostly, if the advective velocity is strong or the reaction rates are strong, this term is neglected. But in other cases, you have to keep it. And R is the reaction rate of species that converge populations. Um, another uh, important, uh, as you sum up the three species, obviously, they should add to a number of the total people uh, per unit area as well as if I want to do the same thing, I can add the densities, um, sorry, the, the, the dispersive and diffusive fluxes into a common term. And I can obtain, if I add these equations together, I can obtain another equation, which is an equation for the density, the overall population density. And again, this has an advective term and a diffusive term because uh, when I add um, susceptible, infected and recovered populations, uh, the, the net reaction rate of all these together is obviously zero. And so this is therefore the closure equation, if you like, that goes together with individual equations of susceptible infect and recover. Um, with respect to um, infection, uh, dispersion and diffusion, we're gonna use this term here, which essentially says that there is a diffusive flux, um, things move as a result of concentration gradients, meaning the population density gradient. Whether this is true or not is, is debatable because we have discussed it at length with my colleagues. The question is, do people diffuse the same way that people that the molecules diffuse or, or disperse? Is there a Brownian motion that takes place in, 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 in a people's behavior? The answer obviously is not true, is, is no. Uh, but uh, until we find out how to actually model the, <laughs> the diffusion or dispersion of people as a result of an applied gradient or maybe a a policy, we're just gonna use this particular term. The most important term now is the kinetics. What are the reaction rates? So we're gonna use what is known in chemical reaction uh, engineering literature, which is called mass action. 
In other words, for the case of um, uh, the infected uh, populations, which is the rate of infection, we will, we will, we will say that the, the, the infection rate is proportional to the density, population density of those who are susceptible times, that is how many people can be, uh, are available to be infected, times the, people, the number of people that are infected. You cannot have infection unless a susceptible person S comes into contact with a infected person I. And therefore the kinetics of this reaction will be a proportional with the constant K of the population density of the susceptible times the population density of the infected. Now, the infected people are also recovered because uh, or die at the rate of lambda. So this is, a, a, and this will be proportional to the rate of uh, uh, the, the population density of the infected people. And this is sort of like a radioactive decay, if you wish, an equation for, of, of that type or something similar to this. And likewise, for the uh, reaction rate of the susceptible people, uh, you become infected or, or you're losing, uh, you're no longer susceptible because you're going to the infected category at the rate that's proportional to how many of these uh, people are available per unit area times the population density of the infected place. So this uh, formulation here is similar to the SIR model. The difference is that in the SIR model, NS, NI, and uh, R only numbers. They are numbers of people. Here, the more important difference is that we use numbers per unit area, because this is really what counts, the density of the people that are available. In fact, when we talk about spatial distancing, it's nothing more than controlling the uh, aerial density of people. And therefore, what we claim is that the right reaction rate should not be simply numbers, should be numbers per unit area. And that's actually the most important part of this, of this presentation here. So let me give you a few notes here. Uh, the parameter that lambda is the inverse time, is the intrinsic rate at which, on average, infected individuals recover, individuals recover or die. And as I mentioned, uh, this can also be, uh, this model can be extended to much, much uh, more demographics and health conditions. An important parameter is this parameter kappa, which is the um, a way by which uh, susceptible people become infected. The uh, dimensions of this are inverse time number uh, in, uh, concentration. How, do, how, how is infection happening? Infection happens because you have collisions, right? So there's contact rate. An infected person comes into contact with a susceptible person. And depending on the frequency of the collision and the contact rate between them, then there is a, a corresponding uh, a, a, a rate by which this infection would happen. This is very similar to the way a chemical reaction takes place where, where molecules collide with each other, depending on the collision rate and the frequency of these collisions, then can have a reaction as a result of that. We contend that this parameter kappa will be an increasing function of density, of the overall density, up to a maximum packing uh, value. One, in the case of chemical reactions with molecules and other species, we can use Maxwell uh, uh, statistics, in, uh, let's say from the kinetic theory of gases, or let's say if you wish to go even further, you can use Van der Waal type of theories in which you know, uh, allow for the fact that there are finite volumes, the encounters are not elastic, they last over finite time and so on and so forth. Uh, however, um, having said all that, we know that uh, the infection rate has to go to zero if we, uh, if we uh, um, uh, obey and honor certain uh, health requirements. For example, uh, we know that uh, spatial distancing requires at least six feet. And so it is very uh, likely that this parameter would be zero if the density is less than a characteristic density rho zero. And this characteristic density rho zero perhaps will be equivalent to about uh, the equivalent of a six feet distance. And one can calculate it because let's say you can multiply six feet by six feet. So this is like 36 feet square. So row zero potentially could be one over 36 feet um, uh, square. Or if you want to, to, to connect it into meter square and let's say make it even more, more uh, easy to um, uh, understand, make it uh, 0.1 meters uh, square inverse. 
Um, also, our row one will be the closest distance you can get, which is the, uh, the distance that, that, you know, because of packing, if you wish, <laughs> you won't be able to get closer to another person uh, by a certain distance. And then you can also define another value for row one. So what is important here is to define a specific parameter, which is the, the we, we make the reaction rate kappa to depend on density, Significantly, we make it zero if it is less than a certain uh, distance uh, density, and then we make it an increasing function of rho up to uh, uh, if that if that if that particular density is exceeded. Uh, so far, we have not played a lot with this. Remember, this is a very early work. We have started doing this only the last couple of weeks or so, and uh, this is a, an important uh, uh, contribution that we want to see later on in this in this uh, talk here. Now, in doing this, it is there is one of the other reasons I want to mention here is that it's meaningless to provide area-wide averages. People talk about states and countries without differentiating about density. The most important thing is to distinguish high density, for example, urban, stadiums, schools, retirement homes, and so on so forth from low density rural areas. I think it is very important to make that distinction when one provides statistics. Uh, and there are some other uh, notes here that we, as I say, we an infected individual, individual can infect a susceptible one uh, uh, at the same rate as uh, if this was not. Um, uh, so many infected individuals are either quarantined or treated, and therefore they may not be in touch with the existing susceptible ones and so on and so forth. Again, this, uh, there's a, a significant room here for expansion. And one can create a, a, a compute, perhaps the division coefficient as people uh, work around and diffuse. We made a calculation, let's say for people that work in an office that do random walks, then we expect that D will be 10 to the minus three meters square per second. I think that will be an interesting social dynamics to understand what are the dynamics of social, social dynamics uh, interpreted in terms of molecular uh, gas dynamics. So if you make dimensional notations, then you come up with all these big equations here. Uh, the, the key here is that the original model does not contain this term at all, or does not contain density uh, dependencies, as well as here, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, these are characteristic of the dimensionless notations that we use. Um, and we define dimensionless numbers, like the Peckland number, as well as the reaction rate. So we simulated a number of special cases. Um, a case in which there is a, a closed system, there is no entry or exit in or out of the system. And this is the standard SIR model, and everything is constant. And that's the batch reactor model in which essentially you put people together into a cooker, and then you let the cooking go, and something happens out of that. Uh, nothing moves in and out of the system. Second thing that you can do, you can enforce health policy. For example, spatial distances, log distancing, lockdown, and so on and so forth, and then simulate the result. Uh, you can relax policies uh, after some time and then see what the effect is of that. Uh, can you get second waves and, and the like? And finally, uh, what we're trying to work here is spatially variable interactions, and that is a thing that we're trying to, we haven't done much on it. Uh, we've done some preliminary work. As I mentioned, this is preliminary work, and. Uh, I am trying to, uh, we're trying to uh, fine tune the model and also try to solve some interesting new idea, new, new cases that provide to, to us significant uh, um, uh, insights. Um, this is a simulation that for R0 equal to five, R0 is a characteristic of the chemical reaction taking place. With red, you see the, 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 the susceptible, with the blue is the infection and white with R is the recovery. So you can see the classical wave, uh, not wave, but maximum of I it goes up to a maximum and then decays. Uh, here we use lambda to be about one over 14 days, which is a typical case. And you can see how the susceptible numbers goes down, how the infection numbers uh, uh, changes and also how the uh, recovery rates change as well. And that also includes um, uh, uh, people that, that perish, as I mentioned. So this doesn't mean that everyone recovers fully. Another example is a situation in which um, we apply a reduced uh, uh, contact after, a, a, let's say, infections rise. So let's say a tau is equal to 0.5. This is a characteristic time. This is, let's say, the lockdown policy. 
you were having a high rate of, of, of uh, infections, and then we apply a, a new policy that immediately then this causes the infection rates to go down. And essentially you are stabilizing the susceptible cases as well as the recover. So one can play and, and with all kinds of policies to implement here and see how things are going to change. Uh, this is another example in which, uh, let's say, after we apply the new policies and the infections went down, then we relax the restrictions and at, at time t is equal to seven. And, and at that time, then essentially we, uh, we, it's equivalent to perhaps having a second wave. And you can see the second wave coming up here. This is a, as a result of the fact that we, we, uh, um, we uh, relax the restrictions and then that corresponds to a different R0. And therefore, even though we we're going down in a nice way and stabilize everything, then after a while, you can have another second wave. It is many uh, in the United States right now and part, different parts of the world are very much worried about a second wave. And this could come, let's say, from the uh, relaxation of restrictions. Now, all these models are very simple um, and we have not yet attempted the most interesting one, which is how to differentiate between and, and have transferred between high density and low density areas. And at this point, uh, it's something that we are in the process of doing. Um, right now, I will stop my presentation because I think my time is up and I will uh, uh, open for conversations or discussion. Thank you so much, Dean Yorksos. That was fantastic. Um, so we do have a few questions for you already. Um, the first one is, how would you explain through your research why there is a subset of people who get COVID-19, recover, but then get it again? And how would this factor into the ambiguity of a person's species in a certain area? Yes, so my, our model does not do that. We can actually add it if we want. Uh, we, have to be, um, we have to be guided by uh, medical doctors or, or experts in the area. Uh, we are not trying to understand the, the genetics of the, of the disease or why people are asymptomatic and the like. So, uh, right now, I, this is not something that we, we claim that this model uh, does. Um, whether, I think a question was asked, is this a model that it is, can this model, so this is a model that's a min field model. With it, by this I mean it's an average. It doesn't, uh, it's not an agent model. It's not uh, a model that, that uh, tra tra uh, tracks or traces a very specific person uh, as this person uh, gets infected. So we're talking about averages. Um, and it is possible that fluctuations are significant, that one can consider them in this calculation as well. But we assume that uh, deviations from the average are not significant, and therefore that we treat everything as a homogeneous mixture, if you wish. But uh, uh, these are, are excellent questions. Uh, many of these questions uh, arise as well in chemical reactions as well. The analogy of chemical reactions with uh, uh, people's behavior is a tenuous one, uh, because you know people are not molecules. I mean, we are molecules, but we are very complex <laughs> set of <laughs> molecules. And so, you know, it's only a, a certain point to which you can draw this particular analogy, but it's very fascinating nonetheless. Fantastic. And we actually had a question from non-chemical engineers. How do your research findings align with the CDC claims, especially when it comes to numbers for unit area? Um, so I, we have not had, uh, we have not yet gone into addressing these very specific issues. I can tell you my sense is that there will be, this model can provide significant contribution that can expand on the models that CDC and others are doing. And, and the reason I say this is because it's, um, um, I mean, it is actually striking that these simple models do not consider the density, which is the most important part in any health policies, density, uh, uh, for example, uh, as we restart research at the university at UHC, the, 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 the command is to de-densify the buildings. <laughs> it's actually exactly what I'm talking about. And um, also, um, you know, creating models of this type that allows you to, you know, move people between different areas and so on and so forth. Uh, we are trying to also look at the imported infection. Uh, let's say some, you know, there, there, there's the issue of uh, people that come infected and fly into a country. Um, you know, what's the effect of that? What's the impact? How important it is? Uh, these are uh, questions that can be asked uh, and be answered very nicely with this model. And we are actually at the beginning of this process as well. 
So this might actually. My, my colleague uh, uh, Sadhu wants to say anything. No, I think you covered it really well, Yanis. There was a question about uh, from Nimita about is this model available for public to experiment? I want to say a couple of things about that. One is, um, uh, as, as you know, we are sort of working on this right now and developing as we go along, but we would welcome um, anyone's interest and participation. So, so if, you know, if you want to try something out or if you uh, want to maybe join the team, <laughs> we would really welcome it. Uh, so uh, yeah, just reach out to us to see what tools we are using. Thank you, Tiffany. I think I abused my time. <laughs> <laughs> As the dean, I think you are entitled to. So uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're only so going here. <laughs> um, now I would like to welcome to the program um, Victor Prasanna. Dr. Prasanna is a professor of electrical engineering and a professor of computer science at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. His research interests include high performance computing, parallel and distributed systems, reconfigurable computing, cloud computing, and smart energy systems. His topic today is machine learning to track the spread of COVID-19. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Prasanna. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Um, I will talk a little bit today about uh, how to use machine learning techniques in uh, predicting the spread of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, uh, in, in the current situation. Uh, this is part of the work we're doing in the data science lab. I'll talk a little bit about the data science lab, and then uh, we've been doing some work in the context of predictive modeling. And then we will talk about how to apply these ideas uh, by using machine learning to more accurately predict the spread of COVID-19. Uh, just to kind of uh, give uh, a general context here, uh, this is meant for a broad audience. Uh, I'm going to share the slide deck. Uh, there's a lot of details I'm going to skip over today. Uh, so also that we have a couple of publications I would encourage you to look into uh, on the archive. Uh, one is about learning to forecast and forecasting to learn from the pandemic. The other one recently we uploaded there yesterday is on data-driven identification of unreported cases. Uh, you will find that this, uh, these two publications will be useful if you are interested in uh, predictive modeling in this space. So we also have a tool that we have developed. Uh, I would like you to warn here that this tool has to be carefully used. There are a lot of assumptions made in the tool. Uh, it needs certain amount of technical background to be able to carefully use this tool uh, to make some conclusions based on the models that we have developed. So I've organized this talk to talk a little bit about the basics and talk about the prior work in our data science lab. And then I will uh, go into the details of a particular model that we have developed here for predicting. I'll go through the details of how machine learning is used in this context. I'll also talk about the visualization tool and talk about some ongoing work uh, that is used here in the context of this uh, project that we just started a few months ago. So this work is part of the data science lab uh, that uh, we have set up at USC. Uh, I welcome you to look at this website, dslab.usc.edu. We're looking at number of applications of machine learning optimization in this context. I will talk about some details of these projects to give you a context of uh, our earlier work in predictive modeling. Uh, one of the work we are doing here on the lower right-hand side here is that we're looking at the machine learning and optimization techniques in order to be able to design complex systems. For one of the projects we are working on, we are working with Intel uh, to be able to accurately predict the memory access patterns and using that information to be able to understand what should be in the cache, what should be in the level one, level two, and level three caches. Uh, this is something that we recently started, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation as well as the Intel Corporation. Uh, so uh, just to uh, give some context here, some term, terminology I'll be using just for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with this. A uh, lot of the uh, accuracy parameters that we talk about, we use a couple of error metrics in this context. Uh, I talk, I'll talk about the MAP metric here, which is the average percentage difference that you have in the predictions, the error that you have in that. We'll also talk about the RMSC error, which is also the root mean squared error here. These are the important metrics that is used here to understand how good are your predictions. You're predicting here on a time series data, and we want to make sure that our predictions are of a high quality, and these two error metrics are widely used for us to be able to understand the quality of these predictions. 
So a prediction here for us means that we are making a statement about the future. And typically here in this case, if we have a time series data here and you want to understand what the future is going to be at, at, at that point in time. So we can also look at what is short term and long term in this context. It depends on the prediction window we have here. Uh, short term is uh, sometimes easier to make in the sense that uh, as the prediction window increases, uh, the, the horizon increases or uncertainty increases, and so that's not going to give us accurate results in that context. In any case, we still need to make a little bit of medium term or long term predictions so that we can use that information for planning, for resource allocation, for example, and then also in policy making and decision making so that we can understand in this general context of uncertainty how this uh, particular uh, uh, a virus is spreading and then I use that information in, in short term as well as uh, uh, medium term planning in, in, in this context. So uh, let me just give some context of the work we have been doing here in the predictive modeling space and then how we are using those ideas currently are adapting these ideas uh, in this context. One of the problems we've been working here uh, is understanding how to do modeling in the context of smart power grid. Uh, the problem is a classic problem that we have historical power consumption data and you want to understand what the future power consumption is going to be. Uh, the key observation we made here is that there is a periodicity in the daily observed data we have here. So based on this observation, we train various models and then we take a collection of those models based on the trained models we have here and we combine these models, what I'm showing here on the right-hand side here, what is typically called here as ensemble learning here. That means you, you train various models and then you, you learn these parameters here and use those parameters to be able to combine those models so that we can make a fairly accurate predictions about the power dissipation, power consumption in a smart grid environment here. You can use various models for our regression here. I've shown here kernel models that support vector, mat, uh, vector machines that you can use here. So typically what happens, what we're able to show here is compared to state-of-the-art mod models, which typically have about 5% error rate we are able to use our ensemble learning models here to be able to reduce the error rate significantly here, reduce that to be less than 2% in terms of short term and medium term prediction in the smart grid, the power dissipation of, of, of problem space we have. One more problem where which we have used uh, uh, predictive modeling is in the context of the smart oil field, a large center that is operating at USC. Uh, one of the problems here is that uh, we want to be able to inject steam into this wells here to be able to improve the increase of productivity that you have in the nearby wells you have in a large oil field. So one of the techniques we use here is by using the machine learning techniques to be able to understand what are the latent features inside uh, this model and use those models to uh, use those features to be able to do regression on the data that we have here and then get use that information to understand out of thousands of wells that is there in a the field, which one of those wells should be injected so that you can get extract more oil out of the oil field operations here. I'm just showing some results here. I will skip the details here, but uh, you can find all these details at the data science lab where we'll talk about the performance improvement we can get by using these deep learning models in the context of uh, uh, smart oil field operations. One of the other problems we are looking at, uh, this is a project funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, used to look, understand uh, to the traffic prediction on the internet scale here. So one of the challenges here is that this traffic is dramatically changing as a function of time. We want to be able to quickly learn these traffic patterns and use that information for routing. And so we developed here LSTM models and those models are used to get highly accurate predictions for what kind of uh, uh, data flow is occurring in the network here and use that information, for example, to be able to understand and do adaptive routing in the network. Finally here, what leads us to this particular problem, uh, we have been looking at some of these prediction problems in the context of a large uh, DARPA challenge. Uh, this was a problem that was specified about five years ago where there was a chicken punia epidemic in the, in, the, in the Americas and then there was an interest in understanding here, what is the impact of travel uh, in the context of the spread of this virus here. Uh, one of my students uh, who's seen here in the center here, Ajitesh Srivatsava is a co-author of this work, of this particular work I'm presenting here today. Uh, he received a special award from DARPA. That's what you see there is uh, Dr. Arti Prabhakar, who was the director of DARPA around 2014-15 timeframe. 
uh, you got a special award uh, based on the particular model that we developed at that point when he was my student. And this is the model that we are going to be extending today to talk about what kind of accurate predictions we can use by using explicitly modeling the internal states in this infected states we have. Also understanding the impact of mobility in that space here. We also wrote a very nice uh, thesis uh, at USC. I encourage you to take a look at this thesis, uh, which is looking at how do we use this kind of network models to be able to understand and then use that information in various kinds of predictive modeling problems. So let us move along. So we'll now talk about the specifics of the model that we have de developed. Again, uh, in the forecasting problem, uh, we are interested in understanding in short term as well as medium term forecasting here. And we want to be able to do them at various levels of granularity I've shown here, state, county level, or city level, that we want to be able to predict, uh, do these predictions. We are also looking at how do we use these predicted models to make some scenario analysis so that we can understand the impact of the various policies uh, that is in place at a particular instant time. time. For all of these things, we need accurate forecast, and that's really the focus, the motivation for our work here to improve these models to get a higher uh, accuracy or higher, we can absorb various parameters that influence this model. So when you look at the modeling choices, uh, there are a number of ways modeling has been done over the last century, for example. Uh, we are focused on regenerative models here. And uh, actually, Dean also has already talked about one of these models, the SIR model. We use the SI model and then improvise on that particular model. The particular model I'm talking about here, I call this as the SIKJ alpha model here. KJ and alpha are the parameters that we introduced here to more accurately model here the various internal states of infection. We also take into account the impact of the mobility in the system. And we also have uh, the another parameter alpha that is introduced here. To be able to understand uh, this data as to be more recent data should be weighted higher than the older data that we have in the system. So we also have one more parameter that is used here that is that is learned in the system here by using data-driven models. And that information is used to linearize the model here. And then we get the hyperparameter selection here so that whatever trained models here will have a high accuracy in, in our uh, implementations. So uh, I'm going to skip this slide. In fact, uh, Dean Yorso has talked about this model. Uh, this is an average. Uh, we have this infection rates based on the average behavior of the population. And then uh, given these parameters, beta and delta, uh, the uh, beta and gamma that is shown here, uh, we define these equations and then uh, learn those parameters, for example, or use fixed values for those constants uh, that are shown here and use that information to be able to use these differential equations. And you can also more accurately model as uh, Dean also talked about earlier in terms of uh, looking at uh, spatial uh, impact or spatial uh, diversity in the system and then how that impacts the various models at the fine grain level. So uh, let's move on to the key uh, ideas that we have in our model. Uh, I call this the heterogeneous infection rate model with human mobility. And uh, we start with this model. This is the basic model that we developed as part of the DARPA grant challenge. Uh, important factor C, C refers to a particular region we have. One important contribution we made in this work is to be able to represent various internal states here. That means infected person could be in various states. Uh, these are the various factors, the rates at which these people are propagating to, to the susceptible people. They get infected at those rates here. Beta of I here denotes the fact that if a person was in, say, infected at time, T minus I, what is the rate at which he's going to be infected here? She is going to be infecting the people. And that's what is the factors we chose here. And the K could be number, for example, we're choosing K equal to 14 based on the 14 day quarantine period we have. We also have various regions here. In, from these regions, people are, uh, uh, there is mobility between these regions to the target region I have shown here. And this is the factor here that is con con contributing here in terms of how many people are going from these regions to a particular target region here. And this factor, this uh, variable delta here captures what is the impact by which uh, these states are being affected by people coming from various regions to a particular region. That's why this is factor delta comes into picture. So by putting this here, we can write this uh, list of uh, differential equations I'm showing here. Uh, one based on the travel, one based on the community spread we have here. 
Uh, these are the details. Uh, this, for example, here, this the factor F takes into account the mobility between the various regions we have here. This is the factor that is shown here. For a particular region, if you're going from that region Q to a particular region P here, what is the impact of those uh, travel factor that is coming into picture that impacts the model we have? So we go through a couple of simplifications here to linearize the model. That's what I've shown here in terms of a linear system of equations. We define this variable here and then we linearize the model by choosing this delta to be a function of betas we have here. By going through these steps, uh, we can write this linear system of equations. So once we have this linear system of equations, uh, we can uh, understand here, we can uh, estimate these parameters by using, for example, the least squared minimization problem that we can define here. One important notice I would like to show here is that uh, a note I would like to make here is that uh, we also have this one more factor coming into picture, which is called the forgetting factor. That means the older data should have less impact. Otherwise, they'll be overfitting in this uh, uh, implementations. And that's what we take care of it here by introducing this extra factor alpha coming into picture here. So I just let you know here that uh, the, the models, SI model and the SIR models here, there are special cases of this model we have. For example, if you choose k equal to one and j equal to infinity here, then we, and delta equal to zero, that means there is no mobility factor coming into picture. Uh, then we get the SI model as a special case of this particular generalized model we have. Let me go through some results we produced when we wrote that archive paper uh, about two months ago. Uh, this is the data that was uh, there on April 10th, uh, not including travel at that point. And then we also show here, we used a number of data sets for performing these experiments. Uh, for example, we used the JHU data sets, Johns Hopkins University data sets here in terms of a number of confirmed cases. Uh, we also used the mobility data from KCMD uh, global data sets that we have. Uh, what I'm showing here is that for the various models, adaptive models, I call them, or models that are machine learned models here in which we uh, constantly learn those parameters, uh, alpha and uh, beta and delta in the, in, those, in, the, in the three parameters we have in our model here. Uh, the variable model assumes that we have variable models for each of the regions we have. Fixed model uses the same parameter for all the models. And then the ensemble model is a linear combination where we learn the weights also as we go along so that we have three different models based on the basic SIKJ alpha model that I talked about. Uh, this uh, GNSCIR is a model that was uh, defined by the Chinese uh, uh, authorities uh, uh, several months ago, and we are comparing the results against that. In general, you will see here that uh, with respect to RMSC as well as the MAP, uh, these models, our models produce uh, more accurate results compared to what the, uh, the most recent uh, uh, state-of-the-art models produced by Chinese authorities. So we also have uh, some data here that is including travel data. Uh, what I'm showing here is for various models we have uh, for within the US as well as for the global data sets where we got the global travel information. I'm comparing with respect to two different performance accuracy metrics we have here. And then in general, the conclusion here is that uh, by using the travel data, we can get uh, more accurate predictions compared to not using the travel data at that particular instant of time. So we also have a number of results we have run here using our simulation as well as we have a user interface tool for doing this. By doing this, we can, we can get for uh, at the country level as well as the state level, we can predict the actual number of uh, infections at a particular time. So there's one more thing we can do with this model. Uh, so we can measure uh, the present uh, using the past uh, through predictions, meaning that our prediction that we're doing here essentially is a model in which it is abstracting the data that you have at that instant of time. So what we can do here is that we can, in, for example, we go back in the reverse direction here and say how the model is evolving over a period of time. So looking at the model parameters, we can understand here what is the impact of a particular change you are affecting in a system or a region because of the various policies you have at that point. So for example, one simple way is that we can look at these parameters which are influencing the beta of I parameter for a particular region P here. We can define certain metadata here, which is some linear combination of these parameters. I have. For example, some of the parameters we have. 
So we can use that information to define a contact reduction score, uh, which tells us here, what is the particular change that you have observed in the model parameters in terms of the infection rates that you have in the model. And that is an indication of how good the system, how good the people, how good the policies are affecting a particular region you have here. So what we do here is that we define this matrix CRS and to look at two different time instants you have here, look at the models at those points here, compare those, uh, compute those values here and take this composite meta, meta value here that gives us the indication of how the policies are impacting a particular region. I'm just showing here the contact reduction score here for the global scale here for looking at the various countries at the particular instant here or using those regions from March 21st to April 10th here. The higher the score, uh, better this is the policy that is, uh, that is effective at that point here. Uh, just showing that uh, it is possible to use this information to understand how various countries are doing with respect to the policies that they have in place at that time. So we can also do a number of uh, what if scenario forecasts by using our model. Uh, we can play with the model parameters. We can choose the number of days. Uh, you can vary the forget, uh, for, forgetting factor that I talked about earlier. Based on that, you get a series of uh, uh, data here, which shows what is the variation see here based on the various parameters you choose here. Uh, that gives us uh, to make for us to be able to make this uh, what if scenario analysis as you, as you do the predictive modeling. So uh, one problem that you face in this is that we need to also account for unreported cases. I would just like to let you know to take a look at a, a paper that we have submitted archived as of yesterday, in which uh, we use the data-driven modeling here to learn some hidden parameters you have in the system. Based on that, we can get lower and upper bounds on what is the, what may be the actual number of uh, cases in the system while we are only measuring the reported cases in the system here. For doing that, we define this parameter which is the ratio of the reported cases to the estimated total cases we have here. And then we come up with some techniques to be able to learn this parameter. And then we also be able to understand here, given a particular window of time, how much can we estimate this other kind of data is, we gave some performance bounds here in this paper to understand how much can we learn from this uh, window of uh, data given to us to be able to understand how much is the uh, estimated number of actual cases that may be in the system. So uh, let me try to summarize here what we did, uh, what is the difference compared to state-of-the-art models. Uh, uh, so I, I think the key observations we made here is that uh, the traditional models, the SIR models, for example, uh, they don't take mobility into picture here. Uh, they use a numerical solution to differential equations. Uh, so in that context, uh, evolving trends are not captured in that. We try to explicitly model that by using those uh, uh, differential equations and introducing those three variables I talked about. Uh, so we also have, uh, uh, so in our machine learning approach here, the infection rates are uh, learned constantly and also the mobility influence rate is also constantly learned here. These are the two important parameters that we brought to the SIR or the SI models in the literature here. We learn these optimal parameters, these betas and deltas here in the system here by using weighted least squares approximation. Uh, we also have the problem of overfitting or smoothing here. And then we take care of that, uh, uh, the smoothing uh, by, by introducing the this, this forgetting factor in those implementations we have here. And then, uh, so this fa the factor alpha here is what is brought into picture here to make sure that uh, we've kind of weighed the recent data more than the older data in the system here. So, so, so by doing so, we're able to get uh, much, much better uh, predictions compared to what uh, some of the state-of-the-art models against which uh, we compared this here. So I just would like to put a point to this. Uh, we do have a visualization tool. We have a nice user interface for that. Uh, in this, you can now, uh, uh, take uh, various data sources you can integrate in this context. You can choose the parameters. Uh, you can choose, for example, K if you want the quarantine period to be increased. So we can, all of those parameters you can play with here and then to be able to visualize here by region-wise, country-wise or state-wise. Uh, so you, you can get uh, a prediction data for various regions here. So this project is an ongoing project. Uh, we are looking at more data. We are working with, uh, for example, Uber and other uh, companies to get some local mobility data and use that information to be able to get more accurate, more fine-grained predictions here. Uh, so we also introduced uh, this uh, uh, this machine learning approach. We need to we need to also work with the hyperparameters we have. 
Uh, so there is some work we are doing in this context to be able to understand how to choose these hyperparameters. And I also talked about how to uh, kind of unreported cases to be incorporated into this model. We do have some uh, updates to the user interface tool that I talked about, uh, where it also gives you the bounds on what is the total number of infections maybe at that point. So part of this work here we're doing here, we are going to the next phases. We are using where uh, some of the network information propagation models to understand what may be the impact of various kinds of uh, uh, relaxing policies that may come into picture. Uh, we also have collecting data about what kind of businesses are frequently visited, uh, what, what, uh, what is the traffic flow into those locations. And using that information, uh, we, we, are, we are looking at uh, what could be the potential impact if we release certain restrictions in the system. And uh, basically the techniques that are used here is based on a, a network infor information for network, inf network diffusion models that are used here in this context text to be able to understand the metadata about how the system is performed. So let me conclude here. Uh, this work is a part of the NSF Rapid Award that we recently received from the National Science Foundation. And uh, this is uh, uh, looking at how to do these predictions accurately, what kind of senior analysis we can make in that context, and also to understand what kind of resource management, for example, how do we distribute uh, medical resources in a particular situation, particular county. So those are the kind of problems we are studying here. I also would like to acknowledge various undergraduate students who have been working with us over the last uh, several months. I'll list the names here. Uh, they have been very, very helpful to us to be able to integrate these data sources, uh, run some experiments for us, uh, produce visualization to also report the results for us, and is gratefully acknowledged for their participation in this project. So let me conclude here. So, uh, uh, so what we have learned here so far, it's been ongoing for the last uh, less than two months. Uh, we are looking at uh, how do we define these machine learning models and how do we learn these uh, models. Uh, we did some simplifications in this process to linearize the model, and we also introduced some additional parameters in that. And then again, constantly we are uh, taking the data, data is changing, we learn from that model, and we believe this model should be evolving with time. That's what we have shown here, we can define parameters using those models. And then uh, we also need to be able to have multiple models for multiple regions. And how do you train those models? A lot of the times uh, the data is not fully available. Uh, there are ways by which you can also uh, kind of estimate the missing data and use that information. We're looking at those kinds of problems here uh, to be able to kind of generate these models, accurate models, and then use some kind of an ensemble approach to be able to uh, combine those models. So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Be safe. Thank you so much, Dr. Prasanna. This research is truly remarkable. It seems that the both short-term and long-term predictions have proved to be very accurate. So I'd like to actually open up um, the Q&A session to our esteemed faculty today. And I believe we have a question for us from Dr. Narahari. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hello, Victor. It was, a, it was an excellent talk. Uh, I, I want to know whether you have uh, tried your model and also simulation uh, on any data connected to India. Uh, India has some conditions which are very peculiar or very unique to India. Uh, for example, we have the migrants uh, situation here. Uh, <clears throat> how effectively can your models be used for the Indian context? Yeah, it's an excellent question of uh, Narahari. I think uh, uh, we are very interested in that problem. <clears throat> we did contact certain sources in India to see if we can get that migrant information, for example. Uh, one challenge we faced is that, uh, again, this is very, very preliminary and we're very interested in working in that. The challenge we faced is that uh, uh, the reported cases from a very fine grain in India, it's very hard to get that information. Uh, but uh, we are very interested in this problem and if there's an opportunity for us to apply uh, by use of our data sets is the key problem that we faced in this context. And when you, uh, if you visit the site I told you about the visualization tool, okay. uh, we have configured that tool to be very, very uh, easy to use as well as to be able to integrate various data sources in various formats. So if some data is available, uh, we should be able to quickly run these models. Uh, these models run uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and also we have parallelized the models so that we can take multiple scenarios and run them on a cloud platform. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Victor. Now I'd like to introduce to the stage Yogesh Simhan. Professor Simhan is in the Department of Computational and Data Sciences at IISC. His research explores abstractions, 
Algorithms and Applications on Distributed Systems. He will speak to us today on Go Corona Go, Privacy Respecting Contact Tracing for COVID-19. Please welcome Professor Simhan. Thanks a lot, uh, Tiffany, uh, and it's really great to be here today. Uh, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Right, so uh, it's, it's really nice to actually share the sort of virtual stage with uh, people like uh, Victor and uh, Raghu and uh, uh, Bhaskar as well, with whom I've had uh, uh, spent uh, several pleasant years at USC when I was a, a sort of a research scientist and uh, research faculty over there. Uh, and uh, all and uh, the work I'm really talking about, I think has some similarities with what Bhaskar will be talking about next as well. So hopefully I'm prepping the ground for him. Uh, and this work is jointly with uh, Tarun Ramba, who is also another uh, sort of uh, faculty at uh, IASC. And all of this started uh, towards the end of March when uh, this is pre-lockdown in India and uh, IASC was sort of starting to get into a shutdown mode uh, because of the uh, sort of rising trend of uh, COVID. And uh, so Tarun and I both of us share interests in uh, uh, network analytics, large scale graphs and so on. So Tarun more from a logistics and uh, like transportation uh, side of things and me more from large scale uh, graph processing and uh, especially temporal graphs and so on. Uh, so Tarun essentially calls me one evening and says that, hey, uh, uh, do you want to work on a large graph problem with uh, application to COVID? Uh, and if you think about it, some of these SIR models that have been talked about in the last uh, uh, couple of, couple of uh, talks by uh, Dean Yanis and Victor, uh, they can be modeled as a graph problem uh, and potentially as a, as a graph problem at the, at the individual level. So if you had a network of people and their sort of uh, physical interactions, uh, which you uh, sort of model as a contact graph, uh, you could potentially run your SIR model on top of that particular network and start inferring fine-grained uh, uh, sort of details in terms of the spread of the uh, virus uh, through the uh, sort of community. Uh, that you're capturing. So that actually started off a 10-week roller coaster journey uh, with Tarun as well as a bunch of our uh, students and staff, uh, which has ended uh, with, with the release of uh, the Go Corona Go app, which actually went sort of was rolled out onto campus about 24 hours back. Uh, so I'll jump in and uh, talk about the challenges facing universities as we uh, start unlocking down and uh, potentially start welcoming students back onto campus. So IAC is a largely residential campus. We are a graduate school having only uh, primarily masters and PhD students. Uh, and oftentimes research is much more challenging remotely compared to this, let's say teaching. So as we are getting into this uh, unlocked down mode and we have start having students trickle down. So it becomes imperative for the campus to ensure the health and safety of our students. Uh, so uh, that puts a lot of, uh, sort of uh, responsibility on us to use whatever tools and techniques are available at our disposal and technologies available at our disposal to ensure that. And it's not just the students, we are also residential campus, largely faculty and staff stay on campus as well. Uh, so one of the thought process that went into this uh, is to see what can we do to proactively ensure that COVID is managed within campus. We try and avoid someone getting infected on campus to the extent possible. And in the unfortunate case that someone does get infected, then how do we proactively manage that? And what can we sort of learn in terms of best practices from, from the uh, uh, sort of global institutions in order to make sure that our students and faculty uh, have a safe, productive, and uh, pleasant time uh, on campus? And there are various techniques that uh, are well known uh, and universally adopted in order to manage COVID. So one of these is using masks, washing hands, social distancing, and so on. Uh, then you have testing at various uh, scales, whether by sampling or through sort of uh, for, for uh, su subjects who are coming to contact and so on. Uh, but again, testing sometimes becomes much more challenging, uh, especially if the lack of availability of test kits and affordability and so on. A third pillar uh, in, in terms of code management is contact tracing. That's, that's sort of going to be the focus of this particular uh, talk. Uh, and there, the idea is that you want to identify people who come in contact, who come or in the physical proximity of someone, uh, an individual who uh, sort of is eventually tested positive for COVID, and then you want to try and quarantine them uh, as quickly as possible so that the spread of the infection is uh, mitigated and you sort of try to flatten the uh, curve rather than see it grow uh, exponentially. 
So a common technique uh, that's, that's used uh, is, is contact tracing. And contact tracing is essentially uh, a term given to talking to the, uh, and manual contact tracing, so typically through interviews, is by talking to someone who tests COVID positive, having them think back and uh, about the last maybe 10 days or a week or so, and asking them where all have you been, whom all did you meet, and so on. So that you can sort of try and track down those other individuals who might have come in contact with this individuals test COVID positive, and then you try and reach out to them and try and quarantine them or put them in isolation or get them tested and so on. Right? And over the last two, three months, uh, one of the uh, supplements to uh, manual contact tracing has been digital contact tracing. Uh, this has proved popular in sort of places like uh, Singapore, China, uh, South Korea, and, and various other uh, countries. Uh, and in digital contact tracing, the idea is fairly uh, simple and elegant. So you essentially have an app running on your smartphone. Uh, that, and the smartphone, uh, most modern smartphones have Bluetooth technology, uh, Bluetooth low energy technology on them. So every phone advertises a unique identifier for that particular device to the immediate vicinity. And typically Bluetooth has about approximately 15 feet uh, uh, sort of range. Uh, and there are the other apps that uh, are there with other, other uh, pe people around you. Uh, they are actually listening for these uh, unique IDs and they make a note of this, right? Uh, and what this essentially is, it's, a, it's almost like a journal or a diary that you keep, except that your phone is keeping track of the other people that you are proximate with uh, and sort of keeps a record of that. Uh, and this could be happening, let's say every one minute or so. Uh, and then what happens is down the line, uh, you sort of keep this data locally. Let's say this A is the person with uh, the app, likewise B, C, and D. So keep the data locally on uh, a local uh, sort of database. And likewise, all the people around you hopefully are using uh, this particular app and they're holding, uh, the, keeping the data locally on their phones. And now if someone in this group uh, gets tested positive, uh, then what ends up happening is that they, their ID, the unique ID they've been using, it gets uploaded to a central database. The, the other app users download that particular information. They check their local database to see if that particular unique ID is present in their local database in the past uh, 10 days or two weeks or so. And if so, it means that they are a primary contact, which means they were in the physical proximity of the person who was tested, tested COVID positive, right? And this can be used as a tool to help assist manual contact tracing to rapidly identify the people who you are proximate with. Uh, and just to give you an example, uh, for example, if, if a person N is uh, the one who's tested uh, COVID positive, uh, he or she uploads their data to the database and J who was uh, proximate with N checks the, uh, his or her local uh, database, sees that they were proximate with N and maybe calls up the health center or, or, or the uh, uh, relevant agency saying that, hey, I was a primary contact, maybe I should get tested or uh, uh, I should get into isolation and so on. And likewise, F, uh, if, if, if it's tested COVID positive, then B is informed and B can take preventive measures, right? So this, uh, there are a bunch of apps. I mean, in India, this app uh, that's been rolled out by the government is called Aragi Setu. So uh, a lot of people around the country are uh, ha have it installed. And uh, the model is similar to uh, what I've described over here. Uh, and this is, again, is used by Singapore's Place Together and so on as well. So one of the challenges with this, however, is that you can only uh, do primary contact tracing, which means that you only know the people uh, who are immediately in contact with the person who's tested COVID positive, and it does not work uh, for secondary and tertiary contacts. Uh, and this is also more reactive in nature. After someone has tested COVID positive, then you try and see how best you can sort of manage the spread of the epidemic. Right? So, what we set out to do is, and again, some of these apps are done at the national scale. So RX probably has tens of millions of users. And then in, in Singapore Space Together, probably a lot of the population have it installed and so on. What we thought was, well, we can potentially do better. Uh, and you can do better by uh, doing a bit more of a uh, centralized contact tracing. And again, that's uh, a little bit more uh, intrusive compared to uh, just collecting the local data and then checking if uh, someone uh, is in contact locally. But what this allows you to do is, is essentially upload the data that you collected in your local database to a central server. And you can stitch all this data together from across different individuals. And you effectively build a contact graph, right? It's, you can think of a contact graph almost like a, a social network graph, except that instead of being friends with someone, you effectively capture the fact that you are physically proximate with someone else. 
Uh, and uh, this effectively forms a graph or a network on which you can do various forms of uh, global analytics, right? Uh, and you also have information about not just who you approximate with, but the duration for which you are approximate with. And this opens up a bunch of interesting analytics. Uh, one is that you can immediately do not just primary, but also secondary and tertiary contact tracing. So, you know, uh, if someone has tested COVID positive, you know their first hop neighborhood, second hop neighborhood, and potentially multi hop neighborhoods as well. Uh, so, that's something that's useful in uh, doing uh, sort of more larger scale quarantine and sort of helping mitigate the spread even more rapidly compared to just primary contact tracing. Uh, a second benefit of this is that you can help proactively identify high-risk individuals. So in this particular picture, uh, A and D are effectively a bridge between two different clusters, the cluster you see on top and clusters you see on bottom. So A and D are much more susceptible to both catching the virus as well as spreading the virus between these two clusters, right? So by essentially testing A and D more frequently or maybe having them uh, be uh, to take more caution, you can actually mitigate the chance that you would even spread the virus in the first place, or you, you would even catch the virus in the first place. Uh, so another example of doing such uh, sort of global analysis is that you can actually calculate cumulative risk scores uh, through primary, secondary, and tertiary. So for example, the same example uh, N is COVID positive. Now you actually spread this risk through the entire network. It's almost like you're doing a temporal breadth first search uh, and sort of propagating this risk through the entire contact graph, potentially with an exponential decay here, all the SIR models and so on can come into play. But the more interesting bit is that let's say another individual F is COVID positive. Now these risks can actually accumulate through the entire network. So someone who might be second or third hop away uh, from a COVID positive, uh, if, if they're second or third hop away from multiple COVID positive subjects, then your risk might actually be much higher than let's say someone who's just a primary contact with a single COVID positive subject, right? But obviously such a global network has a lot of privacy risks involved with that. So which is why uh, the, the whole design of Go Corona Go has been more at the institutional level. It's not designed to be uh, uh, across the city or across the country uh, by any means. It's designed for uh, individual institutions to, to potentially use it and make a more proactive uh, decision making. Right? Uh, another benefit of such, uh, sort of such data is that you can understand what's your uh, social distancing score. So we uh, keep track of uh, the people that you're commonly around with, maybe your, your family or maybe your uh, hostel mates and so on. Uh, and then try to sort of figure out how many new devices or new uh, individuals you end up interacting with. And the more new people you interact with, the higher the risk because you're not adequately socially distancing yourself. So this is something that we can sort of, we essentially get, get, send out scores uh, several times a day so that people are aware of uh, maybe they're, they're not taking adequate precaution in social distancing and they can sort of start uh, proactively reducing the chance that they would catch the virus. So this is a more, some of, uh, an example of another proactive measure rather than just a reactive measure. Right? And the moment you have a contact graph like this, there are a bunch of existing literature that could be applied uh, in, in, in terms of doing analysis and so on. And the important thing is they can do it at a very fine granularity. We're not talking population scales, we're talking individual scales. And you can try and understand uh, how uh, things behave uh, uh, through the uh, contact network. So the question that, that, that's commonly asked, well, you already have a bunch of these national scale uh, uh, contact tracing apps, why yet another one? And particularly Aragya Situ, which is the sort of national contact tracing app from India. Uh, the idea is that GCT is for individual organizations, especially if you have sort of a tight knit campus like ours, uh, where most students and faculty are residing on campus and there's not a lot of venturing out of campus. So understanding the behavior within campus and trying to sort of mitigate the uh, uh, sort of risks is going to be very important. While something like Aragi Setu is designed for the national scales, it, so you can almost think of it as spanning clusters while our focus is more within a particular cluster. As a consequence of doing this centralized contact network, we can do much better analytics as I've described. Uh, and through certain federated models like I'll uh, talk about uh, in a few slides, you can actually try and do this across institutions as well. For example, NCBS is another research institute, uh, which is uh, not too far from IAC. And you do have faculty actually going between these campuses. So you can actually start doing analysis across these clusters as well, based on sort of uh, various types of anonymized data and so on. So we, uh, like I mentioned before, before we can do uh, 
sort of multi-hop contact tracing so that you can rapidly uh, quarantine a, a pool of people who are at a risk. Uh, and uh, you can also sort of preemptively identify high-risk individuals. In graph terminology, these might be individuals with high centrality so that you can uh, have them take precautions or be tested more often. A second is more about uh, sort of data, uh, the control of data. Uh, though GCG collects data centrally, it collects anonymized data centrally, and it's, but it's very transparent about what it collects and the data stays within the Institute. So in a sense, you have, you have much more, in a sense, you potentially have much more trust in your host in this institution in collecting such centralized data with clearly laid out policies and uh, informed consent and so on. Uh, and data is strictly anonymized. We don't collect uh, sort of uh, individuals' names and all those things as part of this. Uh, so that tries to balance. So that's why we call it not privacy preserving, but privacy respecting. So this is uh, something that's completely voluntary for people to use. And we are clear about how we use the data. Uh, and uh, we do have multiple sort of checks and balances in place in terms of advisory boards and ethics committees and so on who oversee our, uh, the use of this data. But this also allows us to tightly couple with our health center. So in case there is a sort of a COVID case that's found on campus, they can quickly work with us share anonymized uh, device IDs of that particular subject with us and we can help them do contact tracing. And then there's a bunch of sandboxing that we do in order to ensure that data leakage doesn't happen and uh, data sandboxed, right? So just a couple of uh, screenshots of the app. Uh, so uh, we do, we are currently going through IRB approval, but we already have an informed consent in place. This is the main screen that you see, the third screen where users can actually get a sense of how, how many scans they've done through the day. So they have a uh, progress bar. It's all, almost like a Fitbit hitting your 10,000 feet. For us, it's hitting 14, for, uh, 40 uh, scans per day on a every minute scale. We send them alerts, both in terms of managing COVID as well as uh, various uh, scanning goals reached or various kinds of uh, news clips and uh, scientific articles uh, as part of this. Uh, there's a little bit of information uh, in terms of various analytics that we push to the users. Some of this is just public information that's available scraped from various uh, government websites, such as the uh, heat map of COVID cases or the growth in the COVID cases and the uh, deaths and recovery and so on, both at the state level as well as the national level. But more interestingly, we do additional analytics on top of the data that's collected. One of these is if users optionally share the GPS data, we can actually give them a heat map of their neighborhood in terms of how many people are there at fairly coarse uh, temporal and spatial scales so that they can plan whether they should go to the mess or to uh, a certain department or so on based on the density. Uh, you can always think of this as a Google map uh, traffic density. This is like a people density in different parts of campus uh, in the neighborhood around you. Another piece of analytic in the bottom right that we show is that two hop anonymized neighborhood so that uh, they get a sense of how many people are potentially getting into second hop contact with them, or they are getting into second hop contact with. So you might only think that, hey, I'm just meeting 10 people in a whole day, but if each of them meets with 10 other people, you're effectively reaching out to hundreds of people uh, through the entire day. So this is a visualization of that, again, strictly anonymized. Uh, this is in terms of the sandboxing that I talked about. So we have sort of three entities in place. One is our Go Corona Go team, which where we've handled the backend and the app and so on. And then there is the IT staff who are responsible for actually sending out uh, invitation codes to different users. So they have the mapping between the uh, individual to whom we send an invitation code and the actual invitation code. When the user activates the invitation code, we only know that it's some invitation code that's valid and we assign a unique uh, random ID to that particular uh, uh, device. Uh, and all the contact data is strictly on this uh, anonymized uh, unique ID. So we have no idea about who this particular individual is in the entire contact graph. And in case someone is actually uh, sort of tested for COVID positive, they report to the health center, they share the unique ID with the health center. And then the, uni the health center works both with us as well as the IT office to de-anonymize the contact network or the immediate contact neighborhood of that particular user and starts reaching out to them to sort of uh, have the primary, secondary, or potentially tertiary contact uh, uh, individuals into uh, isolation. So uh, like I mentioned, this has been uh, rolled out to about, uh, it's made, been made available to about 1,500 students who are eligible to return back to campus starting uh, from Monday uh, earlier this week. Uh, I believe about uh, a few hundred of them have already started arriving on campus. Uh, and we, had, we have actually sent out invitation codes to them uh, almost literally like 24 hours back. 
So what you see in the top is essentially the growth of people starting to use the app, starting from zero. We've reached about 250 or so, so which means of the people uh, likely uh, on campus, uh, the students who have started returning back, several of them, a large fraction have started using it. And strictly voluntary, there's no sort of uh, coercion or mandatory requirement for them to use the app. The other thing that you see over here on the bottom uh, left is uh, how effective the Bluetooth scanning itself is. Again, there's a lot of diversity in the Android uh, ecosystem that scanning doesn't always work properly. But we see that a majority of uh, the users are able to actually send uh, the, the scans successfully. So the failed count is fairly low for most of the users. And there are a few users who are still not able to sort of do the scanning properly. And we have sort of various mechanisms we, which we send uh, sort of uh, information uh, to them saying that, hey, maybe you can try the setting so and so uh, in terms of fixing that. And what you see in the right is essentially uh, data that's coming uh, in real time uh, in terms of how many people are actually actively using the app. And we see about, uh, about 120 or 130 of them are actually uh, using the app uh, and the app is continuing to work. So this is an example of the setup. So the last couple of weeks, we've been purchasing Android phones wherever we can. We've been collecting them uh, just so that we can do fairly reliable contact tracing uh, across the Bluetooth devices because there's a fair bit of heterogeneity. Uh, but there are a bunch of challenges. So one is contact tracing has to have uh, 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 a high degree of adoption within the community for it to be effective. Something like 80, 90% of the uh, people on campus should be using it. And given that it's voluntary, it all depends on how much we can be proactive about sort of assuring them that we are trying to balance the safety, the health and safety versus their privacy to the best extent possible. We've had several town halls with faculty, students, and so on. Uh, and we continue to sort of trying to engage with the campus community to help them make the best choice in terms of using the app or not. Uh, in terms of the privacy concerns, again, we, uh, given that it's it's developed at IAC, managed by IAC, and there's all this sand sandboxing happening between the various entities within IAC, uh, and a fair bit of oversight that's going on. Uh, we hope that this transparency will help address some of the privacy concerns. Uh, then, but there's also challenges with respect to Bluetooth technology itself not being perfect, and uh, uh, there could be uh, sort of uh, data that's lost, and uh, uh, contact tracing itself might not be collecting the contact graph effectively. Those are things that we'll have to study as time goes along in terms of how to resolve that. Right? Uh, there are a bunch of interesting research problems also that's out there because collecting the contact data is really the first step, and that's where the real, real research starts happening on top of that. So one is on the privacy side of things. There, there, there are well-known techniques in the last couple of months that have been published in terms of having rotating keys rather than having a static uh, device keys, uh, which is fairly easy to adopt. But the challenge is that unlike the other systems which do local uh, data collection, and you only need to stitch this data together if there is a COVID positive subject, we are actually continuously building this contact graph. So if we had, let's say, 100,000 people using this across multiple institutions, and each one is sort of sending data every 15 minutes or so, you are potentially looking at trillions of operations just to stitch this data together using these time-varying IDs uh, rather than a single static ID. But we have some ideas that we, we, we have thought through that will actually reduce this search space dramatically. But in the next uh, couple of weeks or months, we might start putting that into place so that there's even better privacy preservation that happens. Uh, and uh, there is also the whole question of uh, how effective will be the various models that we run on top of this contact graph. Uh, and what are the other kinds of telemetry besides the contact uh, network itself, the time duration, uh, the signal strength, uh, optionally location if they share it, uh, any health surveys that might we might uh, sort of send out to the individuals. Uh, how could we use all this telemetry in order to uh, come up with better risk assessments? And at the end of the day, the challenge is that you could come up with all the interesting risk scores, but you never know if it's right or wrong until you have a COVID positive case, which would actually be an unfortunate thing. But that would, in a sense, be one of the few ways in which you can actually validate if any of this is really useful or not. So uh, this, is, this is a couple of slides before I'll wrap up. So one of the thoughts that we have is to sort of how can multiple institutions in the same uh, neighborhood start using this in a more federated model. So the idea is that each one would host their own data in their local uh, cloud or local cluster, but they would sort of strictly take care of anonymizing all possible data and send it to, let's say, a neutral broker, such as IAC, 
where we stitch the data across institutions, especially if you have people migrating across institutions. And then we sort of push back the scores. So uh, that way you would have a federated kind of model, which give you the benefits of this kind of a global contact tracing while still ensuring that the data uh, itself is owned by the individual institutions and the institutions themselves have the assurance that they are only sharing the uh, anonymized data with a, in a, a central uh, uh, neutral uh, broker. So we are hoping this will be an interesting experiment uh, because at the end of the day, until we see this working on the field with people hopefully using it uh, and trying to sort of manage COVID, we don't know if all of this is just uh, pie in the sky or it might actually be something uh, transformative in managing COVID on campus. So thank you. And we have time, I'm happy to take some questions. Fantastic, thank you so much, Professor Stefan. That was wonderful and easy to follow. So we really appreciate that. Um, so I'd like to open this up to Q&A and our first question from the audience is, can you talk about the effect of user compliance on the GCG app? That's a great question. Like I said, unless a lot of people a, use, install the app uh, within the campus and we keep it up and going, uh, it's not going to be very effective. So uh, that's why we are trying to be very proactive. While it's strictly voluntary, we're trying to uh, have these town halls. We, we actually had a two hour town hall with students trying to answer their questions, putting their uh, concerns to ease. Uh, and it's also in sort of having, maybe initially it's a nice novel tool, they install it, but after a few days or a few weeks, uh, they start getting bored, right? Because we've had questions saying that, hey, the app is not doing anything, right? So, and the whole point of the app is not supposed to do anything. It's not like Facebook or Twitter where you're constantly engaging with it. Uh, it is supposed to be in the background. It's supposed to be helping you in case uh, there is a COVID uh, sort of positive uh, individual within campus. So user engagement is fairly challenging and that's something that we are still trying to figure out how best we can do as time goes along. Fantastic, thank you so much. Our last question is from our symposium co-chair, Raghu. Yes, hi. Yogesh, that was a very nice talk, excellent application, potentially useful. So I have a quick question in the interest of time. I mean, it's a good talk about contact tracing and you're doing the privacy preserving, so users are giving. So fortunately, from what we know, just because I came near somebody with a virus, I won't catch it. So it requires a little more sustained contact for some time and exactly how that has happened. So is there a way to know, was it a longer contact or the duration of the thing? And also if somebody has multiple contacts in the same day, who is the high risk? Because we can't obviously test everybody. So is that possible to measure the seriousness of the contact? Right, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, right? So one thing we are able to get is the duration of contact, assuming thing that, that the Bluetooth and everything works fine. So you will know, since we are scanning on a minute by minute basis. So if you've been sitting with someone for coffee for 30 minutes, you'll actually have 30 contacts with that particular person for the 30 minute period. So we know the duration of contact, but Bluetooth can be fairly finicky. So you really don't know if uh, they were within three feet of you or potentially even 30 feet of you, because sometimes the range itself mm. might uh, sort of be fairly large if there are no obstructions. And again, not every phone has the same kind of signal strength uh, that, that you can rely on, right? So there are a bunch of these unknowns. Uh, you also have, for example, there, there's been some uh, study that says that it do really doesn't matter if you spent time with them. If both of you are wearing masks, it probably doesn't matter in any case. But let's say if you are sitting across and someone sneezes, the risk sort of dramatically increases, even if you spent, let's say two minutes with them and they sneeze during the period. Yes. These are all the various unknowns that we have that uh, are going to be challenging. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so before we move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Kumar, did you have a question? Uh, yes, thanks, Tiffany. If I could ask a quick question. Absolutely. Yeah, Yogesh, I enjoyed the talk very much. Just had a question about, um, seems like your app can go beyond contact tracing and actually uh, give some feedback on the efficacy of procedures like social distancing. How often do people catch it in offices, restaurants, and so on? So in other words, uh, it can go backwards and feed into uh, uh, measures that you can take to prevent the spread. For sure. So that's, that's an excellent point. And that's why we sort of see this not just as a reactive solution that does contact tracing, but also a proactive solution. And the real question is what are the kinds of such uh, intu intuitive sort of uh, uh, 
analysis that we can draw out saying that, uh, hey, these are certain behavior within the contact network that might be putting people at a high risk. Uh, so maybe we had to do something proactive. Let's say you see a lot of people uh, come together maybe during mess hall times or something like that. Students are maybe not, you know, we don't know who, who they are, but maybe a bunch of people come together. That might be something that you even notify a warden saying that, hey, looks like there might be something going on. Do you want to sort of go take a look? Or do you want to send an alert to all of them saying that, hey, looks like you guys are sort of congregating, please don't do that, right? So again, all of this can be done without actually knowing who that individual is or even where physically they are present because we essentially have a bi-directional channel to the user and back from there. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Simhan. Now I would like to introduce to the stage Bhaskar Krishnamachari, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. He works on algorithms for the Internet of Things and distributed systems and will present to us today on privacy sensitive contact tracing for epidemics. Please join me in welcoming Bhaskar Krishnamachari. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you all. It's a real pleasure to join you. Um, just do want to mention that uh, I've had a significant association with IIC over the past several years. I, I got to spend some time during my uh, sabbatical uh, many years ago, uh, and we actually have an active uh, joint collaboration with the Robert Bosch uh, Center for CPS on a project related to air quality monitoring. So today, um, the topic that I'm going to present on is actually very closely related to what Yogesh just presented, and uh, hopefully, you know, this is a good complementary presentation to that. So, uh, well, what's happening here locally in LA, I can tell you is that uh, people are just eager to get back to normal. Um, unfortunately, this picture on the left is what it looks like these days in the, um, the beach cities of LA County. People are just eager to be out already. Uh, it doesn't look like it, it did maybe a month or month and a half ago. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the total new cases in LA County, they're still uh, very much showing a rising trend. We're, we're nowhere near, you know, uh, a decided decline uh, in at least countywide. So um, as we've been thinking about these uh, issues, definitely there is a growing push to try and understand risk at a more granular level. And uh, certainly the question of contact tracing has been brought up. What role can that play in helping to understand risk at a in a more fine-grained uh, basis rather than just saying countywide things are looking bad. So uh, I'll mention very briefly something that I won't talk uh, at length about today that's uh, somewhat early on going work, uh, which is can we develop a, a risk scoring metric um, that can be applied at, at some granularity and uh, hopefully it's a little bit more insightful to people than uh, telling them, for example, about um, R0 or RT, these sort of uh, metrics that epidemiologists are more comfortable with. So this is a metric um, that essentially is proportional to the probability of getting infected. Um, and so the risk score, if you have a score of one, it would imply that you have a one in 10,000 chance of getting infected by someone who's currently infectious. So we have this metric that we're able to track uh, for any uh, region for which you have both daily case statistics as well as population counts. Uh, that allows us to actually break it down by communities within LA County. So LA County has about 10 million people in uh, 88 cities and many communities. Uh, so kind of the figure on the right shows how we can map these risk scores by region within the county. Uh, and you can see that there are regions which are actually doing quite well and others that are uh, perhaps more at risk. Uh, and in, for example, recently there's been an outbreak in an area north of uh, LA County called kids take and you can see kind of a, a region there that's a little bit higher uh, uh, risk score at the moment. So that's uh, one effort. I won't dwell too much on this, but uh, I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, this is based on a time varying version of the SIR model, which has been uh, talked about at length in some of our previous presentations. So with respect to contact tracing, let me give a little bit of a, a broader uh, background and history. In fact, uh, contact tracing goes back to the 1930s when the then Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Thomas Perrin, uh, developed it in the context of syphilis um, as a way to really be able to trace forward and trace back the cases uh, in order to be able to isolate uh, the individuals or communities that need greater attention. And we've seen this deployed, this sort of manual approach to contact tracing really deployed uh, in many places, including Singapore, uh, there's an amazing, amazing uh, website 
where you can look at sort of individual cases in uh, Singapore um, and a little bit about the history of that individual, where they got infected, when they got infected, and then kind of tracing this, this graph that um, we heard uh, also Yogesh mention in his uh, presentation. Uh, and you can really see the entire kind of um, contact graph for, for COVID cases in, in Singapore online. Uh, the question I think is one of scale. How do you scale these uh, manual tracing efforts? And uh, even almost a decade ago, we had started to look at how uh, mobile and wireless devices could be used to measure uh, these types of person-to-person um, -person contacts. This is a study from 2008, 2009, where we gave a group of uh, freshmen uh, mobile wireless devices to carry around um, with them as they went through their classes and other activities for about a week and were able to log who met whom, when, and for how long and use this type of fine-grained data uh, to be able to do some modeling and also as kind of a proof of concept of large-scale um, mobile-based contact tracing. So this the history of this type of mobile contact tracing does go back quite, quite a while, uh, including at USC. Uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19, of course, many, many uh, countries and, and governments have deployed contact tracing apps. In fact, the app in India, as you all know, Arogya Setu is one of the top 10 downloaded apps right now in, uh, in the Android platform, for example. Uh, and many other countries have, have uh, deployed similar apps. Uh, but certainly there has been a concern that has grown with the deployment of these apps ha having to do with what type of data has been collected, who is it being collected by, what will be done with it, um, how long will it be retained, etc. And especially if you're trying to deploy your solutions at a very large scale, um, these concerns are quite real, right? So um, back in early March, um, March 4th, I actually posted an article on Medium where I described two particular protocols for privacy sensitive decentralized contact logging. And uh, these two protocols um, essentially have a similar structure as illustrated here. Um, initially, <clears throat> you have uh, pairs of individuals that are beaconing in a completely anonymized fashion to each other. And uh, the two protocols differ as to what is being sent. In one case, it's a random ID. In the other case, it is actually an encrypted uh, piece of information. And um, there's nothing in this information that uh, identifies the device to the other device. But if any individual does get infected, uh, along with the certificate that they are uh, truly uh, infected from a medical authority, this information could be uploaded uh, potentially on an opt-in uh, or at least consent-based uh, basis to a trusted third-party server, which verifies that they truly are infected and makes available this anonymized information for other um, app users to be able to check against. And uh, this allows them to completely privately uh, know if they have been in contact with some patient that's infected. So at no point in this app uh, is there any collection of um, sort of identifiable data from individuals, uh, but it does provide some level of assurance to someone that if they've been in significant contact with an infected individual, they will come to know about it. So this is um, a protocol that we you know, described and, and knowing that adoption will be the single uh, biggest hurdle, we actually reached out to folks at Apple and Google to tell them about these ideas um, in early March. And about a month later, uh, in fact, um, just before Apple and Google uh, made this announcement about their partnership uh, uh, to, to actually collaborate on uh, contact tracing, um, Bluetooth based contact tracing, API is very similar to the protocols that I just described. Uh, I actually was contacted by someone at one of these companies privately and uh, sort of uh, told that the article actually had been read by folks there and had informed uh, their efforts. And in fact, if you look at the protocol as described by them, it's very similar. If uh, Alice and Bob are, are near each other for uh, sufficiently long and um, Bob happens to be diagnosed for uh, COVID-19, um, the anonymous identifier beacons that were exchanged uh, would be uploaded by Bob to the cloud uh, with his consent and uh, anyone else might be uh, able to check whether they have um, copies of this, uh, this log data uh, locally. So uh, in fact, there are many uh, efforts uh, besides ours that have focused on privacy sensitive uh, contact tracing. 
uh, more or less around the same time, I think uh, there were parallel efforts and very similar ideas of uh, exchanging random uh, beacons, etc. Uh, we've actually been collaborating with one of these efforts um, that is building uh, a privacy sensitive contact tracing app uh, that's based out of Europe and Brazil. And uh, we're also collecting some of these uh, more than 50 efforts from around the world and maintaining a repository and uh, in the process of writing a survey about it. Um, one of the questions that this brings up is besides logging contact, who met whom, when and uh, how long, and, and even keeping that anonymous, there's the other question of like, how close were they to each other? So if there is some way to assess the distance between devices, uh, it might give you, you know, some more information to take into account with respect to the risks. And um, generally trying to figure out, uh, you know, distance estimates between pairs of devices can be quite challenging, even if you're looking at radio signal strength. Uh, because of the high variance in these signal strength measurements. Uh, but we're looking at some techniques where, particularly if you're in a crowded setting, maybe a bus or a classroom, that there may be many, many devices near each other. So what you have is not just a pairwise contact, but potentially a graph of contacts. Uh, and so you have a graph of uh, RSS signal strengths, and would you be able to better uh, estimate the individual distances in such a case? And so we're currently working on this problem and have some open source code available as well. With respect to privacy, I do want to mention this fantastic article uh, by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which lays down a number of principles to be kept in mind with respect to contact tracing. It talks about uh, consent. It talks about minimizing the amount of data that's collected to be the bare minimum that you really need for the application. It talks about um, securing uh, these applications and the backends, transparency and open source. In fact, uh, very recently, the Aroge Setu uh, app was also open source with respect to uh, this concern of uh, transparency as to what it's doing, um, to be careful about what biases might be present in the design of the app, and uh, finally, to think about expiring data that's no longer needed uh, past some point. Uh, one other comment I would like to make, something we're looking at is, you know, with respect to adoption of such apps, it turns out there's a very subtle difference between opt-in and opt-out. Uh, prior studies in the context of uh, organ donations, for example, in Europe have shown that countries where uh, organ donation is opt-out have much higher rates of adoption than countries where uh, it's based on an opt-in consent model. And particularly when lives are at stake, uh, you know, the subtle difference between opt-out versus opt-in, you might want to weigh, for example, uh, more towards an opt-out approach. So that's, uh, that's a question we're exploring, uh, actually in collaboration with some social scientists and potentially looking at doing some surveys to understand uh, whether there would be differences in adoption as a function of the consent model. Um, finally, just uh, something else I want to mention, not specifically about contact tracing, but we're also engaged in building a digital twin of the USC campus. Uh, this is a data-driven model which can help us um, learn more about what different policies uh, implications would be with respect to both risk and efficiency. Uh, we're looking at uh, everything from social network analyses to agent-based modeling for this uh, project. Uh, on pictured on the right here is an image of a, a kind of the social network graph, if you will, of USC courses, where there's an edge between classes that have uh, students in common. And being able to analyze these uh, networks of interactions can tell us quite a bit about risks, specifically with respect to campus operation. Okay. We're looking at questions of um, queuing modeling, for example, if you want uh, to keep certain social distancing, uh, even as you enter and leave buildings, what would be the implication on how long it takes to uh, fill and empty buildings or classrooms. Um, so to summarize, I think these digital contact tracing and exposure notification tools are going to be increasingly important. Um, we do think we're going to end up seeing some combination of manual and digital efforts uh, because you're going to want to get down to some very specifics about what are the high risk behaviors, high risk locations. Uh, and some of that, you know, today is done by public health officials in a somewhat um, manual intensive manner. But Combining those with these digital tools, uh, we think has the greatest potential. And uh, at the same time, I think as we think about the privacy concerns, what are the right trade-offs to implement? Uh, what is the right consent model? I think these are all still very much open questions, um, but hopefully we'll all uh, learn and, and share uh, together what, what we learn. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Professor Krishnamachari. I also wanted to plug that he is the creator of the Digital Tech for COVID-19 webinar series, um, which features a new topic every week. And the next one is actually taking place tomorrow. I'm gonna to paste that information in the chat box in case you wanna to join tomorrow as well. Thanks, Tiffany. So we have a question, of course. So we have a question. Um, inside corporate offices and university settings, what do you think of the potential to leverage existing infrastructure such as an other anonymizing network, such as I2P for contact tracing. What was the last part? What for contact tracing? Uh, anonymizing networks, uh, such as I2P for contact tracing. Okay, so um, I think there are other approaches for uh, trying to assess risks in indoor environments or on campus. You know, one possibility, for example, might be to look at association with wireless access points uh, as a way of assessing at least real-time density of uh, occupancy um, in, in particular spaces. So I, I think there's a trade-off often in many of these schemes that has to do with like how much you're anonymizing, how much you're aggregating, what's the, you know, what's the ease with which you're collecting that uh, data and also how useful it is. Uh, but certainly I think there are other options beyond pure you know, kind of mobile-based uh, contact tracing, which is what we've been talking about. Got it, thank you so much. Uh, there was a second part to this question. What are the technical differences in protocols used in the Turing Institute system and the NHS test and trace app I2P TOR? So I don't have all the details of, uh, of these various, um, you know, variants that are, that are out there. At a high level, it mostly boils down to, is it decentralized or is there some centralized collection of information? Um, and uh, even among the decentralized schemes where you're kind of keeping your data local, you're anonymizing whatever's going over the air and only infected patients are uploading anonymized information to servers, uh, there can be subtle differences that have to do with, um, you know, how the, the, uh, the, the checking of the data happens, what exactly is shared between the devices and so on. So there's a few kind of uh, minor variations between those. Um, the other big difference has to do with whether they collect any GPS or location data at all. Um, and that can be useful for certain, uh, particularly the manual uh, contact tracing efforts. They often uh, try to also identify the high risk locations, not just the high risk individuals. Uh, and so, you know, I think that balance is yet to be figured out, uh, but certainly like, the, you know, the two that you just mentioned are but two examples out of literally 50 different uh, contact tracing apps and efforts around the world. Thank you so much, Professor. We really appreciate your presentation. All right, so moving along, I would like to introduce our second to the last speaker. Please welcome to the stage, Rajesh Sunaresan, professor at the Department of Electrical Communication Engineering, the Center for Cyber Physical Systems, and the Center for Networked Intelligence at IISC. He will present to us today on the IISC TIFR City Scale Agent Based Simulator and its use in comparing and lockdown strategies. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'll speak about agent-based simulators for the study of COVID-19 spread. This is joint work with uh, my TIFR Mumbai colleagues. So this is how COVID-19 has spread in India. We had a lockdown on the 25th of March. That's around here. At that time, we had 519 cases and nine had died. Um, the doubling rate was four and a half days at that time. Uh, the, the lockdown has sort of mitigated the, uh, uh, the disease, but it has still risen exponentially. The doubling rate now, since about April 7th or so, is about 14 and a half days, but it's still grown exponentially. Today, we have uh, over uh, 280,000 cases, and the number dead are 7,668. Uh, here is a quick summary of uh, our knowledge of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the COVID-19 disease. Uh, I'll focus only on the red ones here. So this is known to be an infectious one. Uh, the R0, which is the um, uh, mean of the offspring distribution is estimated to be between two and three. Intermediate virulence, uh, it's about three to five times, uh, it has three to five uh, times higher case fatality rate uh, between about 0.5 to 1% is what is estimated than the severe 2017-2018 flu in the US, which had about 80,000 deaths. But it is less virulent than the SARS-CoV-2002 virus, which has uh, a case fatality rate of uh, 10%. Is everyone susceptible? It's actually not clear. 
In fact, there is quite a bit of variation in the severity in those that actually carry the virus. Uh, factors for this individuality is not, are not yet fully understood. So it's possibly better to assume that everyone is susceptible. At present, there is no proven medicine for prevention or treatment. There are studies which are ongoing. Uh, so while we continue to wait for vaccines and medicines, uh, we have turned to case identification, case management, and other non-pharmaceutical interventions for addressing the pandemic. Uh, models have guided us in the use of these interventions, uh, but mostly by scaring the wits out of us. Today's discussion is going to be about one such model. Uh, I'll speak about agent-based model. Um, I'll also discuss some outcomes of our own agent-based model. We are actually working with uh, local authorities here to help them answer some specific questions. So what are agent-based uh, simulators or agent-based models? Uh, what they do is they create a synthetic population of agents uh, in an area that you want to uh, model. Uh, for us, uh, the region that we wanted to model are cities. Uh, then you model the disease dynamics and then simulate the spread in the synthetic population via a Markov chain. So I'll uh, describe this in the context of these two cities. This is Bengaluru and this is Mumbai. Uh, so Mumbai uh, is a much bigger area, but this is what is called the Brahan Mumbai Municipal Corporation. Uh, Bangalore and Mumbai, uh, as in BMC, have roughly the same number of uh, individuals, about 12.3 and 12.4 million. Uh, Bangalore is divided into 198 wards, whereas Mumbai is divided into about 24 wards. So this, what you see here, this color coding uh, gives the population density. So what you do is you instantiate the city with uh, 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 respecting the population density that's given here. So uh, for this, we uh, make use of uh, data from census and uh, geographic information. So what are the ward boundaries and so on. We also make use of information about unemployment ratios and uh, so on in each of these wards. Then you instantiate houses, offices, uh, homes, schools, uh, various shops, uh, maybe offices. And then uh, you associate individuals. Uh, there are uh, as many agents in your model as there are individuals in the city. And then you associate them to uh, each of these locations. That actually uh, leads us to uh, various social networks. So for example, uh, uh, here is a network of individuals, but there are edges across all of these individuals that live in this particular home. So this is another home. There are edges across all of these individuals. So these are all cliques. So that's a particular home network that we have. Similarly, if you look at these individuals, they are possibly school going children. They go to this particular school and then they form a school network. That, that's each school will form a clique that could be possibly smaller sub networks within this, uh, but one could at, uh, for today's talk assume that there is a school uh, network which is similar to the cliques that uh, constitute the home networks. And then you have here individuals that may go to workplaces. So this individual goes to this workplace, this one to the same workplace, and this one to the same workplace. They form a workplace uh, network, once again cliques. Then additionally, there are uh, uh, individuals that may go to markets, individuals that may use public transportation. Each of these is actually an interaction space and all of these could be modeled. One actually gets this sort of bipartite network uh, abstraction of each of these networks. So what we really have is uh, interacting social networks that also takes into account spatial homogeneity. Not only that, it also takes into account mobility because you can uh, model transportation, you can model an individual staying at one in one ward, moving to another location, another ward for work and then coming back and so on. So an individual here might go to workplace, pick up an infection, come back, spread it to somebody at home. Uh, that person may be a school going child, uh, that person may spread it in school uh, to another person and then that person may spread it uh, uh, further down. So this is how things might evolve. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that we create agents, map them to houses and uh, offices and so on, and schools and so on. So how real is our synthetic Bangalore or how real is our synthetic Mumbai? This one is for Bangalore. So on uh, in blue here, you'll actually see the data from census uh, and the red one is actually our instantiation. Similarly, this is the household sizes. Uh, so uh, there are this many households uh, with uh, just one person, this many households with two and so on. And the, that's the blue one and the red one matches the uh, blue one. Now it's not uh, just enough to match these two. You must also match um, 
typical uh, family uh, age mixes. Uh, and uh, we uh, do that as well. This is uh, a matching with respect to the workplace size. So individuals who go to work have to be assigned to various places. And those places must have the sizes that we see in the real city. So we, uh, you can see here that we do quite well uh, for the uh, ones up to about 100. But those which have larger than 100, there is quite a bit of randomness. So this is expected. And uh, this is actually commute distance. So we, when we associate individuals and households to workplaces, there's a certain commute distance that naturally comes out. And does it match with what we actually see in the city? This data, the one in uh, blue, we have from surveys that we have conducted. Our transportation department at the Indian Institute of Science has this data, which gives origin and destination uh, uh, numbers um, uh, based on surveys. And using that, we have essentially generated uh, associations of individuals to workplaces that tries to match uh, uh, this particular density. You can see that we are pushing individuals a little further than uh, what reality is, but this is the best uh, that we could do in the short time that we had. Also, it's, uh, to match this, it requires quite a bit of computation as well. And then this is the school size distribution for school going children. So that's um, how close our uh, Bangalore is to the real Bangalore. In order to build the model, you need uh, a little bit of biology as well. And this we get from clinical studies. Uh, so uh, it is known, this is the best um, understanding as of now, that when one gets infected, uh, there is an incubation period when the viral load grows. Uh, this is uh, uh, typically seen to be about four and a half days or so. And then you, uh, the individuals may uh, start showing uh, and start shedding the virus. Uh, this might be even before they show symptoms. So if they choose to go in this branch and start showing symptoms at a later time, what we have here is uh, shedding of virus and pre-symptomatic transmission. But some individuals may not show symptoms at all. And in that case, uh, we would have asymptomatic transmission. So we model both of these things. And then some people are asymptomatic. That's uh, they move to the recovered state. Some others show symptoms and typically symptoms last for five days and then uh, some may recover, some may need hospital care and so on. Uh, there are uh, very many individual factors here. For example, the elderly are more susceptible. Uh, there are uh, people with comorbidities who may um, uh, uh, suffer uh, um, some, uh, who may need critical care or uh, who have a higher probability of being deceased. These could be modeled in the agent-based system. So for example, this is an agent-based branching. So this is at this level where people that show symptoms What's the chance if they belong to a certain age group that they may be hospitalized? And so uh, here is uh, an age stratified hospitaliz um, hospitalization probability for those that show symptoms. And then this is uh, for those that have been hospitalized, what's the chance that they may get, uh, they may need critical care? And then uh, those uh, that might pass away. So uh, you can see that uh, this is actually quite uh, different across ages. And this is based on clinical uh, studies and we have uh, uh, incorporated this into our model. We can also include uh, 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 probabilities associated with uh, uh, comorbidities. For example, those that are diabetic um, have a 23.8% uh, chance uh, of needing an ICU or an invasive ventilation and or uh, they may become deceased compared to those that don't have diabetes. That's about 6.8%. So one could take this account into account in the agent-based models as well. There are also many other kinds of heterogeneity uh, in contacts. So the previous ones were heterogeneity in individual. This is heterogeneity in the contacts that uh, one would like to model. And the agent-based uh, model enables this as well. I will focus on only one of them because it's an important factor in India, particularly in Mumbai. And that's uh, heterogeneity coming from socioeconomic factors. We have very many crowded households in certain portions of the city. And uh, there are uh, fast uh, spreading, uh, these are fast spreading zones, and one would like to model uh, them as well. There are many other interesting things, I'll not spend too much time on this, but our model uh, has uh, attempted to be faithful to many of these aspects. So why model these interaction spaces and these heterogeneities? Well, it tries to be a little more realistic than the uh, homogenized uh, SIR model. Uh, spatial heterogeneity is something that we saw in a few talks comes in naturally here. Uh, mobility is automatically taken into account when you model people moving from home to work and spreading infection at a workplace or a school, uh, for example. And most importantly, it enables the study of targeted interventions. So if you have these interaction spaces home, 
uh, maybe uh, schools and so on, uh, offices, then you can think about home quarantining. If you know about individual ages, you can think about social distancing of the elderly and see how uh, the simulation pans out. School closures. You can open certain industries alone and uh, things like that. Uh, maybe what kind of containment zone must one adopt? Okay, so uh, I'll just give one example of um, uh, an intervention. Uh, so uh, this is voluntary home quarantine. Following identification of a symptomatic case in a household, for example, in our simulation, we can make all household members, we know who are the other household members in this uh, uh, particular household where an individual has been identified uh, as uh, being COVID positive. We can ask all the household members to remain at home for 14 days. During this period, what happens? Household contact rates will double. That's a possibility. And contacts within the community, however, may reduce by a certain number. And based on possibly Google mobility data and other such uh, uh, information, one can try to understand what these parameters are. And we have chosen based on Google mobility data that this could be possibly about 75%. We also assumed in our some of our simulations, 90% of the households comply. Uh, I'll also show some with uh, 60 or 70% uh, compliance. So what uh, I want to highlight here is that uh, with an agent-based model, you can think of uh, uh, interventions like this. Uh, other ones are case isolation in the home, social schools and colleges close, social distancing of the elderly, and we'll see some more things in uh, the next few slides. So here is a quick comparison of the various agent-based models which are there. Uh, there's one from the Imperial College, uh, which model UK, which has about 67.8 million uh, individuals, uh, they predicted uh, 510,000 uh, deaths. Um, and uh, if you used a certain kind of pulsated intervention, uh, it could be reduced to 24,000. There is a range depending on uh, certain uncertainty parameters, but the middle value is about 24,000. What Britain has seen is, uh, or what UK has seen is about uh, 41,000 as of uh, today. Uh, the Imperial College model also uh, made a prediction for the United States, uh, 22, uh, 2.2 million. Uh, what kind of intervention they modeled uh, uh, to come up with a reduced number, that's uh, something that's unavailable. Uh, but what the uh, United States has seen is about 112,000 deaths. Um, there are many other institutes that have these models. Uh, I know of this Oxford University model, the University of Washington model, and the University of Virginia model. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, numbers that they predict. Uh, there is an Uppsala model, uh, which uh, started development around the time when we started as well. They have modeled Sweden, uh, which has 10 million population. They predicted about 100,000 uh, deaths. You can kind of see that this is about a sixth, and that's uh, roughly uh, what they have between the UK and uh, Sweden. Uh, but if you uh, um, have this mandated social distancing intervention, then it's brought down to 25,000. What Sweden has observed as of now is uh, about 11,000. There is another model in India, uh, another agent-based model, uh, but uh, they too haven't put out their numbers. Our model has put out numbers for uh, Mumbai and Bangalore. Uh, this came out in the middle of uh, April. Uh, we predicted uh, something along the lines of what, uh, maybe a little more than what New York is seeing. New York has seen about 16,000 deaths. Uh, we predicted about 27,000 or so. Uh, and then if we brought in lockdown, uh, then uh, it could be dramatically reduced to 530 in Mumbai and uh, about 30 in Bangalore. But uh, in, we assumed an optimistic 90% compliance. So what we see is in Mumbai, it's closer to about 60%, whereas in Bangalore, it's about 70% or so. And so uh, when we uh, rework the numbers with those new compliance uh, parameters, we seem to be closer to this. Okay, so we built our tool and um, uh, there is an educational tool that we made available for the general public. Uh, you can go to cni.iac.ac.in slash simulator, and you should be able to see uh, a screen like this. Um, you can choose whether you want to simulate Mumbai or uh, Bangalore, but we simulate only 100,000 because this particular code will be downloaded on your computer and it, will run. it runs JavaScript on your computer. You can set up various parameters. Uh, the default parameters are for COVID-19. Uh, uh, you can also choose how many days you want to simulate and uh, you can set up the contact rates. Uh, so what we have here are typical contact rates for uh, that we have estimated for uh, Bangalore. There's one for Mumbai as well. Uh, we have for New York and Wuhan as well. Uh, in a few days, we'll probably update it. 
Uh, here is the uh, interesting area where you can set up various interventions and then you can see how the infection pans out. So here is one example, 40 days of lockdown followed by 30 days of home quarantine of the infected households. Schools and colleges are closed and offices work at half strength. Case isolation after the remaining 30, after the 30 days. And then you can uh, test out how the infection spreads. Okay, so um, uh, this is uh, for the no intervention case. I'll move quickly to uh, our simulation studies. Um, so uh, this particular study uh, is for Bangalore, um, uh, which highlights the importance of compliance. Um, so let me uh, motivate the problem. Uh, this was actually a question that was posed to us by uh, the Karnataka State Disaster Management Authority uh, people. Um, so the Ministry of Home Affairs uh, in its order on the 15th of April uh, imposed many restrictions nationwide and that and said that these restrictions would be will be enforced until the 3rd of May. But a few activities could be permitted between 20th and uh, 3rd of May. Uh, for example, IT and IT enabled services uh, could operate at 50% and so on. Um, uh, the, uh, and, and there are a few other options. Whether to open these or not is a decision that is to be made uh, by the state or city authorities. And they wanted to uh, get a feel for whether they should open this or not. What does our simulator say? Another question was lockdown fatigue. So this is actually the plot of the reduction in uh, mobility uh, near workplaces uh, from a baseline which was in January and February. And this is plotted between April 4th and May 16th. The lockdown started uh, on the 21st of May. So you can actually see a small increasing trend. And then of course, uh, after about the 25th of uh, April, uh, things did open up in Bangalore, uh, which didn't see as many fatalities as Bangalore, uh, as Mumbai. And so uh, you can see increased activity, but you can see that there is a, uh, an increased activity even during the lockdown phase. And so that indicates lockdown fatigue. So we tried to answer this question. What if we have lockdown? but only 70% of the households comply? Or what if we have a phased opening, but we try to put more resources to ensure compliance? And here are the outcomes of our plot, uh, of, our, uh, of our simulation study. Uh, so on this side here, you can ignore this, this is just the log plot of the linear plot here. On this side, we have the cumulated hospitalized case, cumulative hospitalized uh, cases. On, in, on this axis, we have uh, the date. Uh, so this is what would have happened had we not intervened at all uh, in terms of the number of cases. With the lockdown going on forever, with 90% compliance, we would be here. If after the 23rd of April, we opened up a few in the, uh, industries, then we would be in one or the other. So I, we, I, uh, we opened up three industries and we kept all the three industries closed. And then beyond May 3rd, we let them operate at a certain, uh, in, a, in a phased uh, fashion. So if you let them, if we have 90% compliance and you have this phased opening uh, instead of the lockdown, uh, this is how the cases would rise. On the other hand, if you had 70% compliance, uh, uh, then uh, none of the offices open, yet uh, uh, there is a significant rise. So it's actually better to open up offices and uh, uh, push more resources uh, to ensure compliance. Uh, this is where we are. This is the Bangalore um, case. We have actually opened up and it looks like our, predict, our uh, predictions with 70% compliance is kind of tracking where we are uh, uh, today. Okay, uh, a second study and then I'll stop with this. Uh, the second study is for Mumbai. Uh, Mumbai trains opening and phased emergence. About seven and a half million people, there are seven and a half million rides uh, every day in uh, Mumbai. Uh, that possibly amounts to about three and a half million people using the trains every day in Mumbai. So uh, what uh, trains haven't been in operation since about the 22nd of March. Um, so if we open up, what are the chances that things might spread and rapidly? So uh, here is another uh, uh, scenario that we uh, coded up and then we uh, simulated. So during the lockdown, we assume 60% compliance because that seems to be the one that matches with the observations that we have on the field. Uh, but after we open up, uh, uh, and this is between uh, um, April 9th or so, uh, there are soft containment zones which are active. By that, I mean um, when there are no hospitalized cases in the ward, uh, ward is an administrative boundary. In, uh, in Mumbai, it has about uh, 6 lakh uh, people. That's about uh, uh, 600,000 people. 
So if there are no hospitalized individuals, then you uh, uh, have activity happen as if uh, things are normal. But if there are one in thousand hospitalized, then you come to a complete local lockdown. Uh, what that local lockdown means is that only emergency supplies goes in, essential activities happen and so on. And that is modeled as a 25% activity. Perhaps one person in the household goes out to purchase groceries and so on. Okay, so um, uh, the uh, uh, scenarios uh, of opening up then were between May 18th and May 31st. Offices operated 5% and then 20% in June and then 33% in July. And then there is a, a less restrictive opening. So these are uh, the four curves that we have with trains on and off. Two of them are with trains on and two of them are with trains off. And so one can actually see uh, uh, how things uh, uh, might, pan how, how our predictions are. Uh, so how valid are our predictions? So we seem to be doing well with the actual cases, uh, as you can see here. But these are at this moment speculation based on, uh, but some informed speculation based on what we think are reasonable contact rates when one travels on the train. Okay, so uh, I'll possibly end uh, here and uh, um, uh, maybe and open up the floor for questions. Okay, perfect. So we'll just jump into a quick question uh, because we are, uh, we do want to respect the late hour in India right now. So the first question is what would be the efficacy comparisons? of using agent-based models versus spatial kerning mixing models, such as, those, such as those published by the MRC Center for Global Infections Disease Group? Okay, so uh, the, uh, um, the uh, efficiency, I, I mean, in terms of computation or in terms of the ability to predict. Uh, so let me try to answer the efficiency question first. I think efficiency uh, these uh, require a significant amount of computing power. So um, uh, I think one has to uh, budget for those resources. But in terms of the um, uh, goodness of the predictions, uh, I think these, mod uh, these agent-based models uh, take into account uh, quite a few factors which are specific to the city. Uh, so uh, I haven't done any direct comparison with the, with the other models, uh, but... Uh, maybe because of my biased perspective I've worked on this, I tend to uh, believe this a little bit more. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Sunuresan. That was really great information. Is the mini city simulator available to the public in the US as well? Yes, uh, we would like to get some hits from LA. Uh, please mm -hmm. do go to the uh, simulator. It's uh, cni.iac.ac.in slash simulator. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we do have a few other questions, um, but we will actually copy them and send them to our panel at a later hour so that we can uh, still respect everyone's time and continue with our final presentation for today. So I would like to invite our final speaker, Suryam Ganapathy. Professor Ganapathy is a faculty member at the Department of Electrical Engineering at IISC and leads the activities of the Learning and Extraction of Acoustic Patterns Lab. He will speak today on a very intriguing topic to close us off. Does COVID-19 leave a sound trail? So please join me in welcoming Professor Ganapathy. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Thank you everyone for uh, uh, this opportunity to present. Am I audible and my slides visible? Yes. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, topic uh, that is going to slightly deviate from the other topics that have been discussed by other speakers. These uh, other topics uh, uh, were mostly on the contact tracing as well as the spread and so on. So I'm going to move the, uh, the track a little bit on trying to move into rapid diagnostics for COVID-19. So this is joint work with uh, several other colleagues. Uh, Prasanta Kumar Ghosh is another faculty in the electrical engineering department. And he is also an alumni of the University of Southern California. And we also work with uh, doctors uh, in the medical uh, field. Uh, Dr. Nirmala is a medical officer in IAC, as well as uh, Lance Lepkinto, who is a doctor in Mumbai. And several of our lab colleagues, uh, students, postdoctoral fellows, and so on are part of this work. So uh, let me just uh, uh, jump into what we know about the COVID-19 symptoms. So it's been already been about uh, four to five months of the pandemic. And certain studies from the UK and India have already shown what are the possible or potential symptoms that people who have been tested positive uh, show up with. 
So the loss of smell uh, seems to be the most uh, common symptom that has been reported from the UK. And uh, I want you to particularly focus on certain other aspects, mainly the shortness of breath, uh, the presence of a persistent cough, as well as a hoarseness in the voice that we see in uh, several patients. And this is uh, from the Nature Medicine, which was published in May. Excuse me. And a singular... Uh, One quick thing. Can you put it in a slide mode so we can see the whole slide? Is it visible now? Can you? Yeah, that's put it in the slide mode. Yeah. This was in the uh, slideshow mode. I'm sorry about that. So let me just say. Previous one was better. The slideshow. Uh, can you give me a feedback whether this uh, looks fine or uh, is it smaller? This is smaller. Go back though. Previous. This is better. Stay there. Uh, let me go. All right. Fine. You can go ahead. Yeah. This is fine. Okay. So uh, uh, the uh, uh, the previous studies that had uh, uh, shown. Uh, various symptoms. So this is a similar study that has been put up by the uh, Indian Journal in put up in the Indian Journal of Medical Research, and where they talk about uh, the prominent symptoms that have been reported in India from January to the end of April, where cough seems to be the most prominent symptom, along with uh, uh, fever, uh, breathlessness, sore throat, and so on. So again, I would like to focus on the two symptoms that is the cough and the uh, uh, breathlessness. So the hypothesis then that we are trying to answer or ask in this uh, uh, study is that does COVID-19 leave in the voice and speech uh, that are detectable, that can be uh, useful for generating a fast and accurate uh, diagnostic tool. So as the previous uh, slide showed, many of the prominent symptoms include respiratory illnesses, breathing difficulties, and the COVID positive patients, some of the subjects that we have been able to reach out to had mentioned that they have trouble sustaining the voice for long periods, or they have trouble in difficult or trouble in speaking at a fast rate. So what we uh, put together in this study is trying to see if we can collect sound samples from COVID positive subjects, subjects who have other respiratory ailments, as well as those with healthy subjects and trying to see if we can develop computer algorithms that can validate the hypothesis that yes, uh, COVID-19 can leave biomarkers in the voice that are detectable or not. So this is the premise of the study that I'm going to talk about in the next 10, 15 minutes. So this is a little bit of the uh, history of uh, what we know already from other studies that have been published by several other people in the past before the COVID-19 period. So, some of the uh, studies uh, uh, that are corresponding to using cuff sounds uh, with uh, uh, cuff sounds using cuff sounds for the diagnosis of pertussis, which is also called whooping cough, or the COPD, as well as tuberculosis. So these uh, references are here. Uh, breath breathing sounds have been used for identifying obstructive sleep apnea and pneumonia. These studies are also listed here. And speech sounds for non-respiratory diseases like Parkinson's disease have been previously used. And most of these algorithms have been you know, well-cited studies. They provide very high accuracies, like more than 85% in terms of sensitivity is one of the measures of uh, the true positives from the, from the diagnostic tool, as well as specificity, which is the number of true negatives. And many of these studies give quite a good uh, high number of uh, uh, sensitivity or specificity levels that can be practically be used for. So here is one more study. This is again from the pre-COVID days. This is a, actually a, not just a study, it's an app that is already available. It's called the REST app. This is a, a point of care diagnostic tool that has been uh, developed in Australia by a group, uh, the website is here. And what it does is that it uses cuff and breathe samples from subjects using a smartphone like an app and it provides an instant diagnostics for asthma, pneumonia, croup and lower respiratory tract disease. So here's an example from their website itself that I have uh, shown on the right side of this uh, slide. 
what you see is that it provides an indication of whether the particular uh, uh, participant or subject is infected and more diagnostics are available for the healthcare agent if he or she wants to look at more details of the analysis that is done in the app. And this has been approved. Uh, the, the, the developers of this app had also contacted us when we were starting to work on this problem. And they mentioned that uh, this is already a CE mark approved in Europe as well as uh, in Australia. And potentially it is a telemedicine tool that uh, helps in diagnostics of these uh, diseases. Our own team, Professor Prashant Kumar Ghosh's lab, they have already been working on for the last year and a half on trying to grade asthma with uh, various uh, cough and respiratory sounds. So a couple of publications from that group had already come and highlighting those in this slide. So uh, back to the current problem that we are interested in trying to solve in this uh, uh, hypothesis is whether the COVID-19 impacts voice, cough and respiratory sounds that are different to those samples that are obtained from healthy individuals as well as those with other respiratory illnesses. So this is the hypothesis that uh, we wanted to validate. And uh, the use of validating such a hypothesis is that the potential tool that comes out of this will enable very simple and fast testing. As uh, I will describe the details of the app, it takes about five to seven minutes of recording from the subject. And it, of course, is contactless. The person who is participating in the study only uses his or her own smartphone to participate in the study. And what we would also like to provide is a cost-effective solution, meaning that the uh, uh, there will be no overhead cost that we would like to uh, charge any of the users, and this can be useful as a pre-training, uh, uh, pre-screening tool, which uh, can potentially help uh, prioritize who gets the chemical testing. For many countries, chemical testing has run into scarce situations that uh, one needs tools to prioritize who needs to get chemical testing, and this uh, hypothesis, if it is validated positively, could provide a mechanism to allow this priority list. So given this uh, uh, novel goal and so on, so we started uh, putting together what needs to be done in this tool you know, out of the market. And just like any of the machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence based uh, solutions and softwares, there are of course the three stages where one needs to collect data, trying to develop uh, um, uh, machine learning as well as analysis algorithms, which is uh, uh, trying to look at the data and trying to then potentially develop classification models. And the third stage is of course to validate the machine learning models out in the field, trying to see how this potentially can be a diagnostic tool. So given the situation we were with the lockdown announced and so on, uh, when we started working on this problem, we uh, wanted to rely mostly on crowdsourced data, the data that is uh, provided by participants in an anonymous fashion through the World Wide Web, and then trying to use this data to go to stage two and stage three of this problem development. So the first stage was to put together a web tool that uh, can be uh, uh, used for data collection. This was launched sometime in April. And what the tool uh, uses is essentially a, a records the age, the gender, and the location of the subject, whereas no personally identifiable information is collected. And it also records some health indicators of the participant. It is uh, uh, related to whether they have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or they have other respiratory illnesses, uh, uh, pre-existing conditions like uh, whether they have fever, asthma, smoking habits are also recorded. And if they, uh, none of the above applies to them and they are perfectly healthy, that is also recorded. And then the participant moves to generate or record uh, his uh, uh, stimuli in the sense of breathing cycles a shallow and deep breathing cycles, cough sounds, some sounds on speech like uh, a sustained phonation of vowel sounds like ah, uh, uh, and also a counting exercise that uh, asks the participant to count from one to 20 in a norm normal and a fast pace. So we try to make the tool as accessible as possible, providing examples for different categories. And the entire recording takes about five minutes of the subject's time. So once we start, uh, once we put this together and uh, started making a pitch for uh, people to participate in the study, so several uh, participants, mostly through the uh, World Wide Web, mostly through our uh, social media as well as through the IAC's social media handle, uh, got to know of the tool and they started coming together to uh, volunteer their data, and we started getting about 
uh, a few hundreds uh, of participants in the tool. And this is the status of the curated data that was about end of May. And what we start seeing is that about 70% of the participants were male and about 90% came from India and about 90% also were from the healthy uh, uh, status. And dominantly they came from Karnataka, which is the state where IAC is located and therefore has most uh, outreach among the uh, social media handles from our side as well as from IAC's social media handles. And what we also started doing is to start looking at the data to try to analyze uh, whether the quality of the data is good. And we found by listening, manually listening to all the recordings that come through with our volunteers and students and so on, and trying to figure out uh, whether the clean recordings are reasonable enough that can be used for the analysis, we found that about 80 to 90% of the recordings that come through are actually useful for a machine learning tool that can be potentially developed on this data. So while this was all the good news, uh, we uh, started uh, getting about uh, 1,000 participants now so far, uh, uh, the last we checked, about 1,000 participants in the last 40 days or so. And mostly they were from the healthy nature and majority were from India. And the next highest uh, set of uh, participants were from the United States. And we also got some subjects with respiratory disorders, which uh, about um, amounted to about 10% of it. And the data curation and analysis after all anonymization is also released on GitHub for other interested researchers. We had been contacted by other researchers across the globe in the US and, and Europe and so on for uh, trying to attempt their mathematical and machine learning models on this data. And we were happy to share the data with those groups. But what we are starting to find was that the number of positive subjects, meaning COVID positive subjects that were part of the study were significantly lower. So this is when we started trying to contact local authorities, both in the state, in the other states in the country, trying to see if we can open uh, more hospitals uh, uh, and health centers where we could uh, get access to recruiting COVID positive subjects to enroll in the study. And many of these uh, hospitals and health authorities wanted us to get this protocol approved by a central agency so that they can recommend this tool to the subjects. So this was the last uh, you know, month's effort, uh, pretty much, trying to um, uh, send this uh, protocol to the Indian County Research. This is a nodal body in India, which is equivalent maybe perhaps to the CDC in the US. So an expert panel uh, tried to review our protocol. There was a, a feedback from the uh, panel's uh, expert uh, committee head who said that the AI systems are indeed invaluable. There's a lot of variants of cough causing morbidities and this needs to be analyzed. And also the data has to be generated in a context like Indian context or uh, you know, a particular uh, country's context so that it is going to be more local and valid for the conditions that prevail in that country. So this uh, uh, feedback also uh, gave a directive for us to contact local hospitals and uh, use their uh, you know, feedback and review process to help us get access to the COVID positive subjects. So then we started contacting hospitals at several uh, 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 hotspots in the country. We are uh, now in the process of trying to get through their review boards to start a data collection with uh, COVID positive subjects. So this is where we are as the current status of this tool in the last six weeks or so. And this is a, a breakdown of other efforts that uh, have come to our notice. So when we started, there was an effort that was undertaken by the New York University uh, in USA where they were trying to analyze breath sounds. So the breath sounds were collected using a telephone recording and IVR system. Uh, participants uh, had to give a questionnaire and then the participants had to give their breath cycles for a few uh, seconds and then hang up the phone. And this data was supposed to be analyzed by the group in NYU. And during these last six weeks, when we have come up with this tool, we have also noticed several other uh, interesting research happening in other research groups, like Carnegie Mellon University has some speech sound based analysis. Uh, a, a research is undertaken in the UK, in uh, Cambridge University on cough and breathing sounds. EPFL Switzerland is also uh, doing a study using cough sounds. And uh, in India also in Mumbai, there's a, a Wadwani AI Institute founded by the Gates Foundation. They are also trying to see if cough sounds can be used for uh, analysis as well as diagnostics of COVID-19. And uh, last direction in this, this was a study uh, that came across in the uh, uh, last month, this was a, a study that was uh, uh, came from University of Oklahoma, as well as uh, other people from University of Michigan and a group uh, in Ukraine. So what they started uh, putting together is already a tool 
on using artificial intelligence for the diagnostics of COVID-19 using cuff samples. So cuff samples were collected in hospitals from different participants and uh, their health status was also recorded by the physicians who were part of the study. And there were four classes of the participants that were enrolled in the study, ones who were normal and healthy, ones who were uh, having bronchitis, others pertussis, uh, which is another respiratory ailment, and a last group, which was the COVID-19 uh, positive subjects. And note that there's a disclaimer already present in the study that they were able to collect only about 48 COVID positive subjects uh, to participate in the study. And even with this uh, uh, small amount of uh, subjects, the team put together some analysis uh, with uh, deep neural uh, networks and other machine learning tools trying to see if they can extract interesting features as well as machine learning models to classify these four categories. And what you see on the left is a confusion matrix which pretty much indicates that uh, for the uh, true class and the predicted class for the COVID-19, they get uh, north of 95% accuracy using this sort of a approach. And in the tool, they also have an uncertainty metric. They also try to say if the test is inconclusive so as to reduce the number of false positives or false negatives. And they are, while they're getting good, the sensitivity is north of 80, 89% uh, for, from the app, they are also able to show that they can reject, uh, you know, if the test is not conclusive based on uncertainty measures involved in the modeling. So again, this is just a, a preliminary study, the early efforts, very small number of samples were used. And uh, I also have provided the source of the paper here, but these are kind of uh, uh, encouraging results to show that maybe there is a possibility on large scale level to try to invoke uh, cough, respiratory sounds, as well as speech sounds, and try to use them for rapid diagnostics. So our own uh, funding collaborators and connections. So we are uh, trying to uh, 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 seek as many you know, uh, people involved and trying to expand the study to uh, uh, involve more subjects, uh, trying to get into uh, more directions than where the study can pan out. The Department of Science and Technology already helped us with providing some funds for the seed work. The Health Center in the Indian Institute of Science through Dr. Nirmala has uh, already allowed us to perform data collection of patients with other comorbidities. Typically, the Health Center receives 30 to 40 uh, patients with respiratory ailments every day. And the hospital in Mumbai that we are trying to uh, uh, collaborate with is a COVID positive uh, testing center and facility, and they receive a few hundreds of patients every day. It's a private hospital, and we are trying to go through their uh, review boards to get this approved for recruiting patients. And hopefully this can happen in the near future and we could get uh, more inflow of uh, data from COVID positive subjects. Also working with uh, or trying to work with several industries, Amazon is uh, keenly uh, interested in trying to work with us in developing an Alexa app, which can enable data collection. And very interestingly, several startups in wellness and wearable uh, directions, like uh, uh, people who with uh, different wearable devices like ECG monitors or SPO2 monitors, pulse temperature monitors that measure physiological signals. They are also trying to collaborate with us to see if the, uh, bio, the biomarkers through the physiological measurements can be coupled with voice and sound-based data to provide a better diagnostics for COVID-19. And this we feel is a quite interesting direction where we can combine uh, you know, acoustic skills as well as skills from uh, wearables as well as uh, healthcare components. So uh, just to conclude quickly, the pros, of course, we identify as uh, uh, at the beginning itself is going to be simple, fast, cost-effective testing, and most importantly, contactless. The, uh, you know, uh, no risk associated for healthcare uh, professionals in this direction. And the considerations that we have is, for example, if the hypothesis on a large level is not proved, what we still believe is that the resources that are put together, the data that is collected in this project, and uh, the resources that are coming through are going to be useful in the future for other respiratory sound-based diagnostics. So these are, you know, a big market has been predicted for telemedicine and uh, uh, these directions in the future to allow contactless uh, testing. And we find that some of the resources that may come out of the project are going to be useful in the future, irrespective of whether the COVID-19 diagnostics can hypothesis can be validated or not. And as, we are, as I already mentioned, other directions include coupling this with other uh, sensors, like a digital stethoscope, for example, body temperature, pulse rate. We find that this is exciting to add uh, you know, a voice or a sound-based uh, analysis along with this to uh, aid the detection of several respiratory ailments, including COVID-19. 
So this is a, a, a seriously a work in progress, very active data collection, event detection work is happening right now to separate uh, uh, the acoustic events that we are interested in modeling as well as trying to build uh, classifiers uh, for identifying healthy versus unhealthy subjects. And this is our ongoing efforts. I would like to end this talk. And here is uh, uh, the set of uh, uh, follow-up that one can do if you're interested in this work and following up on what is happening, the website, uh, our Twitter handle and the Facebook handle is there. And in particular, if you are data practitioners interested in trying to use this data for uh, you know, analysis, if you think that you have already worked on it or already have some expertise in respiratory or uh, modeling or acoustic event modeling, and we are actively releasing the data through GitHub uh, to encourage you to participate in this uh, analysis and study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. That was some really fascinating data. And uh, we had a lot of questions come in and uh, Professor Zunarestan helped to answer some of them. But one that I did want to touch upon is a question that just came in. Since 90% of samples are from India, would the study have an inherent training bias in the demographic biomarkers? So uh, uh, we don't know that yet as uh, with COVID-19, with many of the symptoms, we really uh, don't know whether the uh, COVID-19 symptoms that are coming through or in the voice as a biomarker are particularly country specific or region specific. So uh, uh, there is a possibility that it can have a broader outreach than what is uh, observed in the study. But it could also be, for example, some comorbidities like respiratory ailments that affect the lungs that happen in India may be different from the UK or the US. And these comorbidities may, uh, may not uh, reflect in the data that we are collecting. And again, you know, the, for the participants and uh, you know, listeners of this talk, you know, if you are interested and uh, you are going to provide us the data or you are going to spread the information and provide us the data that will help us potentially in analyzing these aspects as well as uh, how the geographic uh, nature of the study is going to influence our detection. Thank you so much, Professor. And at this point, I would like to conclude the symposium. Thank you all so much for joining us today. As I mentioned, this symposium is being recorded and will be released to registrants in just a few days. Thank you to our speakers for providing such relevant and cutting edge content with your research. And thank you to our symposium coordinators, Professor Raghavendra and Professor Kumar. Have a great day, have a great evening. And as we say here at the University of Southern California, fight on. <laughs>